Hello everyone, and welcome to Fictional Vortex, so we are back with an interesting series on what if Naruto was Ninja of the Sand. But before we start, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Let's start the story. The battle was over. Kayubi, who had destroyed much of the Leaf Village, was defeat. He was now trapped in the body on a newborn baby. It had cost the fort's life, but the village was now safe from the monster. However, one problem still remained. This thing is a danger to us all, said one leaf ninja to his friend while pointing to the crying baby. We have to kill it. It doesn't feel right, killing a baby from our village, said the other. The two of them were alone in the room where the third had left the baby. Their job was to guard the child. Then we won't. Let's just send it to a different village. Let them deal with the beast. I don't, it's that or death for the runt. I think Wind Country is a nice place to dump it. So it was decided. That night the two of them took the baby Naruto out of the village and head into the Wind Country. The plan was to go into the Wind Country and find a nice sand dune near a road and leave him there. When they got back to the village they would claim he was stolen by an enemy and they chased him for as long as they could. Before they left the child, one of them placed a note on the baby. His friend gave him a look. The note just gives a little information about him. His name, Naruto, and why we are doing this. I figure they have a right to know. As they began to leave the scene he looked back. Sorry kid, I hope someone finds you. Naruto did the only thing he could do, cry. T that is so so sad, cried an over emotional Mihashi. My shirt was beginning to get drenched with her tears. The vein in my forehead began to grow. Would you shut up? About an hour later, Aoi, leader for the Sand Anbu and chief of interrogation, was walking down the road. She had long, messy dark blue hair that ended at her shoulders and lavender colored eyes. She wore a black trench coat over her Anbu uniform to hide the two boomerangs that wear on her sides. Her figure was ideal for a woman of 25. She was returning home from visiting her parents' shrine in tea country when she heard the heard the cry of baby Naruto. She slowly walked over to the child thinking it was a trap. The child had blonde hair and blue eyes. He also had three whisker marks on each check. Then she noticed the note, which she picked up and read to herself. So, you're holding a demon inside of you and your village does this to you. You poor thing, she says as she picks up the baby. Don, worry, I'll take care of you. Ah, a scorpion. She flicks it off and begins to race back to the village hidden in the sand. The sun was just coming up as Aoi approached the gates of the village. A figure in blue and white robes stood in front of them, waiting for her. You're late, said the case cage. Sorry, it's fine so how are your parents, Moroku and Sango, doing? They're fine, I can't believe you were asking me about them, said Aoi with a smile. She and the case cage had grown up together and he rarely asked about the well-being of others. I don't care about them, however if something is wrong with them you might not be able to concentrate on your job, as he said this he finally notices the baby in her arms. His eyes bugged out, it hasn't been that long, okay tell me what happened. Aoi told him about the baby in the note. As she did this, the case cage's eyes narrowed. Once she was done, he told her about the attack on the leaf village by Kayubi. So this is how they defeated the mighty Kayubi, said the case cage as he examined the child. Please tell me you aren't going to be keeping this son of a. Before he could finish Aoi's free hand went into her coat and pulled out a paper fan. Then she quickly moved behind the cage and began hitting him upside the head. What have I told you about using foul language, asked Aoi as she continued her assault. When hit was over the cage had several new bumps on his head. Why me, asked the case cage to the stars. Smiling, Aoi took the now crying child into the village. She stopped and turned around to face the cage as he got up. You know I think Naruto will be a great advantage to this village. Two aces are better than one. You must mean Gara. True, he will one day be an ace, but that is a long time from now and much can happen. Aoi's smile grew wider. Regrets, my dear friend. You were the one who wanted to turn your son into a demon container resulting in the death of your wife. Who was the one who said no? Come, let me think. Oh yeah, it was me. Don't give me that bull about future problems. This is what I want. I want to be this child's mother and to give him the best possible future. I want a family. Fine, but on two conditions, said the case cage with a hint of malice in his voice. She had hit a sore spot. 
he was still getting over the death of his wife that only happened a few months ago. Very well, what are them? First, you can't ask for a raise, all if face faulted. Fine ya cheapskate. The other is to tell Naruto, which is a weird name by the way, the truth of his origins. Where he is from and why they discarded him. Let's see how well he handles it. Very well, said Aoi. Now, if you will excuse me, I have some things to buy now that I'm a mother. Five years later Aoi had gotten up early to make breakfast. Perhaps it was guilt that made her wake up so early. Last night she had told Naruto about the note, where he was from, and where she picked him up. He did cry, but the look in his eyes spoke volumes of hurt and anger. Aoi feared her days of being called a mother were close to an end. Aoi and Naruto live in a nice two-story house near the Keisukeja's palace. The inside was decorated with weapons on every wall including the bathroom. There were also a lot of pictures. Some of her parents and their friends back when they were still young. Others were of her and the case cage growing up. The new ones, that had replaced some of the ones including the case cage, were of her and Naruto. Karara was sleeping on the kitchen table when Aoi walked into the room. She woke up, gave a cat like yawn, and left fearing she would have to taste test breakfast. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Aoi sighed wondering who it was. She opened the door to see her favorite half-demon holding in his hand several letters. Why is your mail coming to my place? Asked Inuyasha as he handed her the letters. After the fight with Naraku ended he married Kagome and was living in the village that was once home to old priestess Kaide in tea country. Kagome was now a priestess. Sorry, said Aoi with a little blush. I don't want anyone around here to know about these so I gave them your address. I can't believe I got some answers. What are they about? These are answers to a personal ad I put in the paper. Let's see who we got here. Toad Hermit, pass. Long live the power of youth, maybe. My wife is troublesome, not my problem buddy. Hum, what's this? They gave me that one when I entered this village, right after they took the present I got for Naruto. Kagome is going to kill me. As he said this, his voice became more of a whimper. Aoi look at the scroll that had the symbol of the case cage on it. Inside was information on when and where to meet him. Can't he just call me on the phone like a normal person? Don't worry about it. He'll get it from the guards. So tell me, what did you get him? You better not have put in the flea again. No, I got him something useful. A brand new demon katana, I'm sure he'll love it. Who would give a five year a sword? Me. Before Aoi could go into this any further something from behind her jumped to Inuyasha. He caught it with his right hand by the collar and gave Naruto a big smile. He was wearing pajamas with little foxes all over. How's it going blonde? Fine. Did Ya come out here to wish me a happy birthday? Ya and I even had a present just F guards took it. I mean, why do they assume everything that comes in a box with a bow on it is a boom? Well, began Aoi, there was an incident about 20 years ago. A package came for the last case cage that was full of deadly incests, snakes, and some explosives. Talk about overkill. Both Naruto and Inuyasha's sweet dropped. Well I better get going or my wife will kill me. Just because I still have my good looks she thinks I'm going to two-time her. Well happy birthday kid. With that, Inuyasha left the boy and his mother and headed home, knowing there would be some sit commands coming his way. Back at the house. Naruto was scared to see his mother cooking, again. The last time she tried she had created some new kind of explosive and destroyed half of the house. Mom, how about cereal and milk instead, it might be safer for us. Ah, sure thing sweaty, said Aoi. As she got out the bowls she asked the big question, Honey, why did you call me mom? After last night I thought you won't want to see or speak to me anymore. I mean I kept something that important from you for a while now. Naruto simply gave her his big foxy smile and placed his hands behind his head. I know, and I was angry for a while, but, you kept me knowing that I have a demon inside of me. You took me in when anyone else might have just left me there to be buzzard food. Naruto's smile never left his face as he said this. Well, until he heard a sniff from his mother as she was holding back the tears. The next thing he knew she was behind him, she put her arms around him for a hug, picked him up, and started swaying him back and forth. Mom, stop, can't, breath, please, breathed Naruto. Aoi set him down and looked at him in the eye, well for that young man you get to pick out dinner. Ramen, 
Okay I have to meet the case cage today so you behave. With that they started to eat, but stopped and ran to the bathroom. Aoi forgot to check and see if the milk had expired. Later that day, Aoi was at the sushi bar that the case cage had told her to meet at. She had just placed her order when he sat down next to her. Sir, what is this about? I want to know how it went with Naruto. That's all. You must be bored to ask about that. Well to answer that, he was shaken up at first but got over it. Aoi stopped and gave the case cage a big smile, he's just so cute. Cute my ass, before he could finish, the back of his head was hit by a certain paper fan. Grumbling me continued. Did you know what he did last week? I'll tell you. He switched all the bathroom signs at the Sand Academy, it was chaos. Aoi started laughing. That was so funny when you walked into old lady Rukia while she was on the john. You don't know if Naruto did that. The case cage sighed, he takes after you too much, like mother, like son. I'll take that as a compliment. I do need something from you, Aoi. An assassin for tonight. Who is the target? Wait let me guess, you're soon again. Well the answer is no I will not take any of the Anbu off duty to kill a five year old boy. How about you act like a father for a change and talk to the boy, get to know him. You may have a love for demons, but I don't. That sand of his is scaring everyone. He can't control it yet. Just give him some time and Evie thing will be fine. He's actually very nice once you get past those surls around his eyes. Yay my food is here. The case cage got up and left. He knew that she wouldn't do it and he couldn't get any of her elites to do it either. They were too loyal to her. He left to find someone who could do the job. Meanwhile, Naruto was walking around the desert village looking for something to do. He was wearing a white shirt with the symbol of the sand village on its front and blue shorts. Run, he heard some kid shout. It's Gara. Naruto ran to where the sound came from and stopped. He saw a small boy there with black pants, a dark colored shirt, and some sort of cloth that was draped around his neck and went down to his stomach. He had messy red hair that was cut short and pale blue's eyes with dark circles around them. This was not why Naruto stopped. He stopped because the sand was grabbing one of the kids who were trying to get away. Don't leave me alone, cried the redhead. Then sand from around him began to merge and then shot at the captive boy. Naruto, who liked to take action first, quickly jumped into the path of the sand and took up a guarding position. The sand hit him hard but he didn't back down. Then the sand let go of the captive boy, who then ran over to the others who were cheering for Naruto. What's going on here? asked Naruto. Why did you attack them? And when was the last time you got any sleep? After the last question everyone but Gara Swede dropped. Then one of the boys behind Naruto spoke up. We were playing with that ball when it got stuck up on a wall. We didn't know what to do when he used his evil sand to get it. Then he started walking over to us and we were scared. Why were you scared? Because, he's a monster. Naruto then noticed that the boy was holding the ball and was shaking all over. Naruto began to remember his mother talking about a boy she watched sometimes that had the power to control sand. His eyes then narrowed as he looked at the red-headed boy. Your name is Gara, right? asked Naruto. All the boy could do was nod. He could feel a killer intent coming for the blonde in front of him. Then the blonde haired boy began to slowly walk towards him. He stopped about a foot away and placed a hand on the ball Gara was holding. Thank you, he said to Gara. As he did, his expression changed to a warm smile that calmed Gara down in a heartbeat. But, a second later, the killer intent was back and he turned to face the children in back of him. What's the matter with you ingrates? He does you a favor and this is how you say thank you. Naruto grabs the ball from Gara and throws it at the children. Take it and get out of here. If you do this to him again you will have me to deal with. The kids ran away as fast as they could. As for you, Gara, you shouldn't try to make friends with people like them. They are just fools. My name is Naruto by the way. So, why did they call you a monster? Gara gulped. He knew Naruto would hate him once he found out. Better to tell him now and get it over with. I have a demon inside of me, it's been there since birth. Naruto's reaction was not what he expected, he began to smile and jump up and down. Wow, same here. I thought there was no one else like me in the world. I mean I know there are half demons, but I didn't know there were more demon containers out there. So what kind of demon do you have inside of you? An owl? A raccoon. That's cool I have a fox named Kayubi, 
said the still smiling Naruto. Let's play some games. Gara blinked. Why would you want to? We just meet. Can you give me a reason not to? My dad, he's the case cage. So, my mom's the leader of the Anbu and chief of interrogation, and she kicks your dad's ass. Naruto was suddenly hit in the back of the head by a small rock and fell face down into the sand. On the rock there was a note. Gara picked it up and read it. Dear Naruto, what have I told you about using that kind of language? Love mom Gara sweet dropped after he was down reading the letter. Then he started to laugh. Naruto got up and started to laugh as well. They played until Gara's uncle came to pick him up and then Naruto meet up with his mom at the cheap ramen stand where they always went. Later that night, Naruto was jumping from rooftop to rooftop thinking of how he could pull off his next big prank. This was going to be his best work yet. He then heard a loud cry and he decided to check it out. There was Gara, but now the word love was written on his head and there was a dead body in front of him. Wh what happened here? asked Naruto to the sobbing Gara. Why do you care? You all hate me. I thought that at least Yashimaru loved me but he didn't. He tried to kill me under my father's orders because he wanted to. He said I am a failure that Nidus was a bit too much for Naruto to take in and think of the right thing to say. So he walked over to Gara and, before his sand could stop him, hit the top of his head. What was that for? cried an angry Gara. His anger was growing and the sand around him was swirling around him. To knock some sense into you. I care because I'm your friend, you idiot, can't you even figure that out? This shut Gara up. I have some idea what you were going through. I wasn't born in hidden sand. On the day I was born my village sealed the Kayubi inside of me and then tossed me aside to riot. How do you think I felt when I found out? On hearing this Gara calmed down a little. I just don't know who to trust now, said Gara. Well, trust is hard for everyone. Or at least that's what I've been told. Tell you what if you ever find out that I'm plotting against you can kill me on the stop. How's that sound? I, ah, uh, don't think that will be necessary. Hey Gara, you want to hear my dream, asked Naruto. It's to become K's cage and change the way this place works. I want this village to be a place where demons, half demons, and humans can all live together in peace. That sounds nice, said Gara. Then he began to laugh. Ya no ill do the same. Just in case you can't make it. Ha I'll do it before you get rid of your night light. The two of them then started to laugh. They laughed until their sides hurt and tears came down their eyes. When they both stopped an idea came to Naruto. Hey Gara, can you help me with a prank? That morning when everyone, except the people at Gara and Naruto's house, woke up to go to the bathroom, they found an avalanche of sand coming right towards them. Gara was walking down the street with his teddy bear. The people who saw him looked at him with fear and hatred. It had grown since the death of his uncle, but Gara was fine with it. After all, he had Naruto now. Ever since that night in October, Gara and Naruto were inseparable. Together, they were the great team of pranksters the village had seen since all. From drawing mustaches on people's faces to burning dog poop in burning bags and anything else they could think of. With Naruto's planning, as well as his stamina, and Gara's insomnia, there was no challenge, in their minds, they couldn't overcome. However, today Gara was alone. This caught the attention of a couple of ten-year-olds who did saw this and decided to get some payback. Hey monster, where is the other one? asked one of the boys to the little six-year-old. He's not feeling well today, said Gara. He has a high fever and I was going to get some medicine to help him out. Ah oh, isn't that sweet, said another boy with a mocking tone. He's trying to help his friend. I bet we are in the way and you need to hurry. Well, too bad. The boys began to laugh while Gara remained unaffected by this. Suddenly, one of the boys grabbed his teddy bear. Please give that back, said Gara in a calm tone. She doesn't like to be with other people. She'll get ever angry. Hey guys, said the first. What should we do with this? Rip its arms out or stick an exploding note on it. At this they all began to laugh tossing the bear around to each other. However they stopped when they heard a voice. Stop that I'm getting dizzy. The boys looked around to see where the sound came from. Down here, said the bear. What the heck is going on? asked one of the boys. Then the bear jumped onto the ground, landing on its face. The boys looked at it in shock as it got up and brushed itself off. They huddled together in fear as Gara stood where he was with no emotions. 
Then the bear turned to face them. You jerks, I am not a toy. I am a great demon who watches over this boy. Now you must repent for what you have done to me. As the bear said this, he began to grow. Claws sprouted out of its paws and feet. His mouth opened and the boys could see several rows of sharp fangs. It stopped growing once it was twenty feet tall. The boys began to cry and wet themselves. They begged the bear creature not to eat them, the said they had learned their lesson. Very well, laughed the bear. I just have one thing left to say before I go. What's that? asked the boys in unison, voices shaken. Gotcha. The bears went, poof, and was replaced with a five-year-old boy with blonde hair, blue eyes, and three whisker marks on his big smiling face. The boys fainted at this, their eye wide open and white. Gara could no longer hold back the laugh he had been suppressing since the beginning of this prank. Naruto joined him as he walked over to his friend. Best idea ever, laughed Gara. When we get to the academy, you are going to rule a transformation. Was there ever a doubt, said Naruto. I took me a week to get this jutsu to work but it was worth it. Just then, one of the boy's mother came over with an angry expression on her face. The boys just looked at her with a calm expression on their faces. You little brats, I'm going to make you feel like she. She was cut off as Aoi exploded from the sand underneath them and smacked her with her paper fan. Please don't swear in front of children, said Aoi with a calm tone and a smile on her face. You don't know what happened here so don't tell me what to do, shouted the angry mother. But I do know what happened, as I saw the whole thing. Aoi turned to Naruto. That was very good Naruto. I'm so glad I showed you the jutsu and how you were using it. She turned back to the mother. If you were watching you would have seen that it was those sorry excuse of academy students that started it. Shut up you bitc, whack. Stop that you is, whack. She, whack. With that, the mother ran, grabbed his son and ran from Aoi. Later, all three of them were eating ramen while laughing at what had happened. They did this every time the boys played a prank so it happened often. To Aoi, the ability to pull such pranks was a key step in becoming a true ninja. It combined planning, stealth, and, with these boys, teamwork. Anyone who would fall for these pranks shouldn't call themselves ninja, in her opinion. So, said Aoi to the boys, are you two ready for your trip tomorrow? The boys nod. Good. Now I want you both to behave as best you can since I won't be able to join you. Why not mom? Aoi begins to cry. It's because the case cage won't let me. He says that I have used up all of my vacation time. She lets out a big sigh and then goes back to her usual sunny self. By the way Gara, I want you to do me a favor. The next day Aoi was working in her office. It was a small room found in the basement of the case cage's palace known only to a select few. The office itself was dark, cold, and damp when she first took over. However, now it had changed over the years to make itself more cozy. The walls were painted blue and on the walls were pictures of each Anbu doing something in their free time. Behind Aoi's desk was a group photo of them all smiling without their masks with Aoi in front. Suddenly, the door to her office flew open as the case cage came in. When Aoi looked up she could tell he was angry by the veins in his forehead. Where is she? demanded the case cage. Aoi, of course knew who he was talking about. But where was the fun in just telling him? After all, it was better than paperwork. Which she are you referring to? The old woman in the cafeteria is homesick, so don't get the meatloaf. I think your receptionist showed up, but I can't be sure since I haven't been up there yet. Let's see who else could it be? She began resting her head in her palms, pretending to think. Tamari. That is who I am talking about. I have been looking all over for her, but can't find her. So, why come to me? It's part of your job to keep me and my family safe. Aoi laughed. That's rich. A few weeks ago you wanted me personally to slip poison in your son's water when he spent the night with Naruto and me. Now you say it my job to keep your kids safe. Gara is an exception. Now find my daughter. Relax, I know where she is, said Aoi while she giggled like a SC me. She went with Naruto and Gara to the reunion at my parents' place. I asked Gara to ask her if she wanted to go. It took a little convincing on Gara's part, but in the end she decided to go. I bet they're having fun. Why didn't you ask me, her father? You won't say yes. Of course I won't. Those people are nutcases. You only say that because they have a sense of humor. Relax. 
Think of this time as a little vacation for the worries of fatherhood. Of course you never act like a father, but that's beside the point. The case cage just stared at her for several seconds. Just how long do you think you can get away with these insults to me? Sorry, I'm just stating facts based on what I can see. Besides, you look so cute when you get angry. Before the case cage could respond, an Anbu member wearing a panda mask came in. Lady Aoi we have an intruder in the village. Any clue to who it is? asked Aoi. No ma'am, said the Anbu. All I can tell you is that he has white hair and his last known location was near the women's bathhouse. A pervert, said Aoi with a sigh. Then an idea came to her that caused her to grin in a way that sent shivers into everyone's shines. Well it looks like this is a good time to try out a new jutsu that was just brought to my attention. This caused the case cage to raise his eyebrow. Who created it? What does it do? Aoi said nothing to him. She simply got up, walked over to the Anbu, and whispered in his ear. The Anbu gulped. I thought you were joking when you last brought up that jutsu, said the Anbu. Get all available Anbu to the bathhouse and let them know what to do. You will tell them that you will all be using that technique. Once he is unconscious, have him brought to the holding cell. Now go. The Anbu left. So, now will you tell me what you are using? asked the case cage. His patience was wearing thin. Sure, sure. It's called. Meanwhile, Karara was flying towards tea country with three small children on her back. Wow, so this is what it's like to fly, cried Tamari. Yeah, it's great, said Naruto. My mom and I do this all the time. Hey Gara. What's wrong you don't look so well? To say that Gara didn't look well was an understatement, he looked terrible. His face was bright green and his cheeks looked puffy, he was also panting. I don't feel so good, moaned Gara. Must be air sick. Don't worry, my mom says that some people get it. It took them about hour to get to their location, stopping only to calm Gara's stomach. The last spot they landed at was a clearing about a half a mile away from Moroku's temple. When they got off, Gara laid down on the ground and started to hug the earth. Let's just walk the rest of the way, suggested Naruto. Thanks, Naruto, you really are a good friend, said Gara while his eyes acted like water hoses. Gara got up and then readjusted his gourd that he had gotten from Naruto for his birthday. Can we just get going? sighed Tamari. She was dressed in a white shirt and pants. Her hair was tied into a single, short ponytail. With that, they began walking to the temple. While they walked, Naruto told them that this reunion was held to celebrate the defeat of Naraku and to remember those who fell that day. He also told them that they wouldn't be the only kids there, so they would have people to pay with. Also, don't stare at Kagura or say something that makes her sound weak. We still haven't found the remains of the last group of people who did that. Those poor boy scouts. Hey, interrupted Tamari. Is that it? She pointed to a temple that looked a little run down. In the yard there seemed to be a small hole. Yes, we're here. Naruto began to smile and suddenly fox ears pooped onto his head. Hey, can you two please go on ahead? I have to get something ready. So, what do you think he's planning? asked Tamari as they walked to the temple. No clue, replied her brother. When the two of them reached the temple, they didn't see anyone at first. They began to look around for signs of other people until they heard a voice behind them. Who goes there? The two siblings turned around but saw no one. Down here, cried the voice. On the ground was the flea demon Mioga. Now don't make me repeat myself, yelled the demon. Who are you and why are you here? I'm Gara and this is my sister Tamari. We're friends of Naruto. He invited us to this celebration. Oh, well why didn't you say so? I'm Mioga, servant of Master Inuyasha. The party's going on in the back. Come on let's go. The two sand siblings walked around to the backyard of the temple where the stopped to look at the strange bunch that had gathered. Inuyasha, who looked like he hadn't changed at all, was helping Kagura put up some pinatas of Naraku. Shippo, who looked like he was 16 and wearing a similar outfit that he had when he first met them all, was helping the grey-haired Sango bring out snacks. Kagome, who was in her late 40s, was watching her twin children as they played in the yard. Koga was trying to get out of Ayame's death grip while Moroku was just laughing. Master Inuyasha, we have extra guests. They claim to be friends of Naruto, yelled the flea. Well come on over you too, said Moroku as he moved some of his grey hair away from his face. 
In a short time they meet with everyone. Even though Gara's personality had become more open he was still a bit shy around these people. So, where is Naruto? asked Hanya. He was Inuyasha's son and was about 30 years old. However he looked 12 and looked like a mini-me version of his father in a blue kimono. Demon blood does the body good. Yeah, I was hoping he'd come, said Mamiji. She was Inuyasha's daughter and resembled more of her mother. Also appearing about 12, the only thing that looked odd about her was her dog ears. He said he would be here soon, said Tamari, he said he had to get something ready. Inuyasha, came a soft dreamy voice from behind everyone, they all turned to see a very familiar Miko. Kei Kikyo, stammered Inuyasha. He then began to run up to her to give her a big hug when she went poof and in her place stood Naruto. Why you little, he stopped as he felt a very familiar anger behind him. Inuyasha. Wait, Kagom I can explain. Before he could say any more, Kagome began a very long series of Sid commands. Now Naruto. Began Moroku, that wasn't very nice. He deserves this, said Shippo. Everyone else nods while Kagura simply watches with a smile on her face. Gara and Tamari looked a bit confused, so they were told that the person Naruto impersonated was an old girlfriend of Inuyasha's. They all watched for another minute and then went to start the party. So Shippo, how are things going with you? asked Naruto as he began to hit the Naraku pinata. Fine, just fine. The ladies just can't get enough of me. Ah. Uh, Miss Ayame, why are you holding on to Koga like that? asked Gara. Because every time I let go, he tries to run away. So, you're Kagura, said Tamari. I don't see how wind is any use in battle. Would you like me to show you? An hour later, Kagome's voice gave out and Inuyasha crawled out of the crater. Back in hidden sand, Aoi walked into the interrogation room, there, clad in special chains that absorbed chakra. So, Jiraiya, we meet again. I haven't seen you since I took the Chunin exam. Aoi, looking as sexy as ever. I was just doing some research when I saw a vision of heaven that quickly went sour. A small tear came to his eye when he was finished. You must be referring to the sexy jutsu that my son created. I was wondering when it would come in handy. She closed her eyes and gave him a sweat smile. You're married? When and to who? Please give me the details. No, I adopted him. Now tell me. What are you doing in here? Truth be told, I'm looking for a boy. The third asked me to find him about five years ago. Before we killed the two kidnappers, we were able to find out that they left him here in Wind Country. Other than that I have no leads or clues as to where he is or if he's still alive. I see. And what will you do when you fact to Hidden Leaf, what else? I doubt he would want to. If this boy you're looking for is still alive, he must have been adopted and living his own life. What right do you have to take the life a young boy away from him? Jiraiya stared at her. He had only met her a handful of times and she always talked in a calm and gentle manner. However, her voice had become very angry and her body was shaking. He took this information in and decided to get more information. He might have been so fortunate, he could be a slave or homeless, if he would come back with me he could be safe and be trained to protect himself. No, I'm sure that he is fine and well loved. She was now sending out a powerful killer intent that would have made the case cage run home and hide under his bed. Aoi would never let Naruto go and would kill this man in front of her before she let that happen. So, you have Naruto don't you? Don't even think of denying it. Your emotions have given it all away. What happens now? I'm not sure, said Jiraiya. May I ask you a question? Aoi looked at Jiraiya with the utmost hate. She knew he was just trying to gather more information from her. But then, what could he do? The chains that bond him were sucking away his chakra little by little. If he were to escape, somehow, she could just use that jutsu. Fine, ask away. How does the boy get along here? Why do you ask? Jiraiya sighed. As you know, the Kyubi destroyed many lives. The people back at the leaf are finally done rebuilding and moving on with their lives. If its contain were to come back, they might not act too kind to him. He would become a target for the people's hate. That is no way for a child to grow up. However, if his treatment here is no better or worse, then I could give him hope at the prospect of a new home. False hope you mean? Very well, I'll tell you what you want to know. The truth is that many people look at him as an annoyance. Unlike Gara, Naruto seems to keep his demon under check and the people realize that he also keeps Gara sane. 
However, he is a bit on the loud side. Well, he is very loud and very over energetic. So, would the people mind if he left? For the most part, yes. At first, the people of the sand would like him to leave so they could get some peace and quiet. But, that would change quickly for two reasons. The first is Gara. With Naruto gone, Gara would revert back into his old self and most likely go on a killing spree. The other is that, while the people don't realize this, they need him to keep up their spirits. Ever since he could walk, he's been pulling pranks. Because of these pranks, the people's spirits have lifted. People have been smiling more in the last two years than they have in the last ten. I see, said Jiraiya while taking in this new information. He chuckled slightly. The way you talk about him reminds me of another person that you and I both know. Aoi closed her eyes. She remembered the day she met him. It was the final round in the third part of the Chunin exam. Aoi was first up and staring at her opponent, Arashi Kazama. She was wearing neon pink pants and matching top with no sleeves. Her hair was short, think of Hinata's, but very messy. On her sides were her boomerangs, which were made of demon bones, and she had Karara was on her shoulder, ready to fight. Arashi was wearing a similar outfit, except it wasn't pink. His blue training clothes matched his eyes perfectly. He had a cocky smile on his face and was waving at the people who were cheering for him to win. Well now, can we please get started, said Aoi with her sweetest smile. There are others who have to fight today. The blonde laughed and started to rub the back of his head. Yeah, I guess you got a point. No hard feelings when this is over, right? Would never dream of it, said Aoi who was still smiling. Hey, said the judge, interrupting them before they could continue their conversation. You two are being too friendly. First match, begin. Let's get it on. Aoi quickly grabbed her two boomerangs. Double hirikatsu, she shouted as she threw them both. Rashi dodged the attack and came at her holding a shuriken in each hand. Aoi's weapons returned to her just in time to block his attack. Not bad, maybe I'll have to go all out with you, said a still grinning Aoi as she blocked each of his strikes. Arashi was smiling as well. Well to tell the truth, I'd rather you just go out with me, but, this works too. Up in the balcony with the other participants, a younger version of the case cage watched the match with a scowl. His other teammate, Baki, noticed this. What's wrong? asked Baki. It's Aoi. She's playing with him, enjoying herself. She could have finished him by now, but she'd rather use those toys of hers. Lighten up a bit. She's probably saving it for the end, you know a big finish. She takes being a kunoichi too lightly, she is a fool. Oh really, said Baki to his teammate. Are you saying that because she is having fun flirting with that leaf nin? A vein appeared on the case cage's forehead at that point. It continued to grow as Baki continued. I mean, I can see why she is having a fun time. He's funny, looks better than you, and I bet he's smatter than you. Let's not forget that he's polite. Why, if he was in our village, I bet they would be dating now and you'd never would have had a chance. Baki, said the future case cage. Yes, speak again and I'll slit your throat and do things that ever Wes Craven could dream up. Back on the arena, Aoi and Arashi are still going at it. Each time one attacks, the other blocks. In other words, a standstill. Or at least that was what Arashi thought. Karara jumped off Aoi's shoulder and landed on the ground. Looks like your kitty is abandoning you, Aoi. Maybe you should try toads, they're much more reliable. You think she's leaving me, think again. Behind Arashi, Karara grew to her big form. You know what I'm taking about, and growled at him. Let me make this simple for you, said Aoi. You have two choices. One. Surrender and no harm will come to you. Your other choice is to continue, but then you'll get a large scratch on your back. At that Karara lifted one of her front paws for effect. Well, I am having a good time right now so let's not end it so soon. If you insist. With that Karara lunged at Arashi and made contact with his back, however, he went poof and in his place was a log. Two against one doesn't seem very fair, said Arashi from halfway across the field. Arashi cried Jiraiya from the stands. Stop flirting and pay attention. I got a lot of money riding on you. Who did you bet with Aero Sanin? yelled Arashi. Orochimaru, now quite wasting time and finish this. Fine, fine. Let's do this, Shadow Clone Jutsu. 
suddenly there were ten arashis, all holding shurikens. You call that fair? Fine, double hirikatsu. She hit one of the clones as they charged at her. Well I was saving this for the last match, but you're worth it. Wine tunnel jutsu. With that, a large black hole appeared in front of Aoi and began to suck up everything. The clones didn't stand a chance. Arashi was using his chakra to keep himself planted, but it wouldn't last long. He couldn't move his feet to get out of the way and there was now use throwing things at her. Only one choice left, he thought. Toad summoning jutsu. With that, Gamabunta appeared. Hey Gamabunta, can you please knock her out? Fine, just don't bother me again for a while, said the large toad. With that, his large tongue shot out around the range of the wind tunnel and hit the ground a foot away from her. The force sent her flying into the wall, it was over. When Aoi opened her eyes again, she saw Arashi standing above her with a worried look. You okay? he asked. Aoi smiled. What a gentleman. I'll be fine. Arashi helped her get back on her feet. Hey Aoi, shouted the future case cage. Stop the stupid grinning, you lost. What the hell, before he could finish, one of Aoi's boomerangs hit him on the side of his head. Stop that you bitc, wham, it happened ages forever you is, he just doesn't learn, does he? That was the first time we meet, said Aoi to Jiraiya in the present. Come to think of it Naruto does remind he of him. So, is he Arashi's son? He wasn't married, but that doesn't mean he didn't fool around. So, who knows, answered Jiraiya. Will you be taking my son away? Jiraiya paused for a moment. What should he do? He had his orders and he knew he had to follow them. But, if he did he would be ripping apart the life of a five-year-old boy whose life had barely begun. He would lose his friends, home, and a very loving, if not a bit weird, mother. In the leaf he would have nothing. But, then again, if he didn't he wouldn't get paid. Jiraiya then remember what Aoi could do to him if he decided to take the boy. The wind tunnel jutsu was something to be feared, especially in his current condition. No, Aoi. I won't take your son. Back in tea country, the three young sand nins were learning from the seasoned fighters that they were staying with. It was late, near sundown, but the children were in awe of the powers they saw. Tamari was with Sango and Kagura. Kagura had just finished showing off her dance of the dragon technique to the young blonde female. Wow, all that from that tiny fan, and no hand symbols either, exclaimed Tamari. Kagura smiled. Yes, the fan is a wind user's best friend. It is both a graceful weapon as well as stylish. But don't forget, interrupted Sango, that it is also the biggest weakness. Once the fan is damaged, it can't make wind. That means the owner can't use any attacks with it. Just what are you trying to say? asked Kagura, who had several ticks. Are you suggesting that my fan is weak? Well, it is tiny and fragile, commented Sango. Well, it beats carrying that idiotic boomerang around. Excuse me? My Hirikatsu is more reliable than that fan. You just think bigger is better. Bigger only means it has a better chance at hitting stuff in a brutish fashion. It's nothing short of barbaric. You want a piece of me? Tamari just watched as these two women got ready to fight. Naruto was with Inuyasha and Koga. The were eating the one food they all agreed on, ramen. This is so good, cried Inuyasha, who was on his sixth helping. You bet it is, cried Naruto, who was on his ninth. It's good, but not that good. This came from Koga, who had only had two. Well, said Inuyasha, better get down to business. Naruto. That katana I gave you is a demon blade made just for you. Really? Can it do the wind scar or backlash wave like yours can? asked an anxious Naruto. Kid, if I did give you something like that, your mother would kill me. But don't worry, the Kitsunsaiga has powers all of its own. It was made from one of my fangs and some of Kayubi's fur. Like my Tessaiga, it has a barrier on it to keep people with demonic charka from using it. From what I can remember, it has two attacks. The first is called Kitsune Wave and the other is Kitsune Strike. That's all the old kud told me. Naruto looked disappointed. Last year he had seen Kagura and Inuyasha fighting. During that fight, he saw those two attacks and thought they were awesome. He had been hopping for at least the Backlash Wave. So, how will I know when or how to use them? asked Naruto. Well, demon swords have a will of their own. They tend to show its owner their power when it feels they're worthy. Plus, 
you need to bring out some of your demonic chakra to use them as well. I don't know how to do that, said Naruto. He hung his head low. Gara could use his demon's powers at will. All he had was self-healing and stamina. We'll see about that, thought Inuyasha. Later that night, Gara was trying to force himself to sleep. This, however, just wasn't happening. Thank to his demon, he found himself unable to sleep period. This caused him to have many, many boring nights with nothing to do. Moroku came into his room to check up on the boy. Gara, why are you still up? I don't sleep. Come again. Gara sighed. I don't sleep. I have never slept a day in my life. Hmm, maybe a story might help you sleep. He watched as Gara's eyes light up. Really, you'll read me a story? No one has ever done that for me before. Really, that's a pity. Let me go find a nice book from the temple's collection. With that the monk left the room and headed for the library. When he got there he found he had run into a slight problem. What to read to a six-year-old boy? The library had many books that Kagome had brought with her from here era, but they weren't something you read to a boy as a bedtime story. A religious scroll? Even he hadn't read them all and found the ones he had read dull and uninteresting. There were no children's and Moroku was not going to break his promise to the small boy. Well, I guess I'll just read him this book. I'm sure he won't mind. He went over to a wall scroll on the side of the room and pulled it back. Behind it was safe where he kept hidden his treasure. He only brought it out during emergencies or when his wife was away. And this was an emergency. He opened the safe, took out the treasure, and went back to Gara. I hope you enjoy this Gara, said the monk as he helped up his first edition of Icha Icha Paradise. The next morning Naruto went to check up on Gara. For some reason he hadn't come to breakfast and usually he was the first to show up. Naruto found his friend sitting in his room staring into space, his eyes wider than he had ever seen them before. Gara, or oh. K. Okay. Gara just nodded his head. Later, at about noon, Inuyasha called both of the young demon vessels out to the field. When the boys got there they saw that he had a stern look on his face. What's wrong? asked Naruto. Well, there is no easy way to say this so I'll be direct. You two have power that gives you an advantage over most people. The problem is that you can tap into it or use it to its full extent. It's a similar problem with half demons. There's one way I know how to help you both. What is that Mr. Inuyasha? asked Gara as Inuyasha pulled out his sword. This, wind scar, said Inuyasha as his attack raced towards the boys. To say they were scared would be an understatement. They were beyond that. There was no way they could block or dodge it. No chance to survive it. Fear gripped them and they began to watch their short lives flash before their eyes. Then, they were somewhere else and alone. Naruto was in what looked like a sewer or leaky basement. Dim light came from the ceiling, but there were no lights. Suddenly he heard a noise and found himself walking toward it. Soon, he found himself look at a cage with a seal on it. Behind it was a creature with large red eyes. Naruto said the first thing that came to his mind. Doggy. I am not a doggy, exclaimed the beast. I am the great Kyubi. Kneel and tremble before my greatness. Naruto was not impressed. That's a nice bark, from somebody behind a cage. Come on kid, I have waited a long time for this couldn't you at least act scared? Well, no point now, the mood's ruined. At this the Kyubi sat down and started to pout. I can't believe that you're the great Kyubi that attacked the leaf. This is just sad. The giant Kitsune ears went up, but that was it. Just what do you mean by that? Everyone expects demons to be heartless or evil or whatever. We just can't have feeling. Well I do buddy. You try living in this condition, having no one visit you, and when someone does all he does is insult you. And just for the record, I didn't attack the leaf. I was looking for something in that village and they attacked me. Naruto was confused. Wait, you were looking for something? Yes, the gate. I wanted to go back home to Demon World. You see, this world and the Demon World were once connected be several gates. Demons and humans could pass into the other at any time. However we have to close them once you humans began to imitate us. How did we do that? You humans did it with chakra. Some humans who envied own power worked hard to mimic us with their chakra and jutsus. Some humans even forced them to mate with others to create families with what you call bloodline limits. Many of our peaceful demons left and sealed away most of the gates and left few open, but hidden. 
The ones that stayed, stayed for revenge. Over time the ones that stayed forgot the reason why they hated humans, but killed them anyways. I, however, stayed to fight them to test my strength against the best. But, as time went on, all of the worthy ones died at my claws and I found myself waiting decades before someone foolish enough to come along and bother me. In the end, I decided to go home. But when I reached the gate that would take me home I found a village had been built on top of it. Before I had a chance to walk away a group of leaf nin attacked me. I fought back and was later sealed inside you. You mean, they started it? They attacked you for no reason? The jerks? Humans fear what they don't understand. What they fear, they try to destroy it. Perhaps I should have been the bigger one and walked away. Now I suffer for that mistake. I am now forever bond to you. If you die, I shall as well. Am I dead now? No, if you were I would be out of this cage at the very least. I brought you here to help save our lives and give you power that will continue to protect us. Suddenly, a scroll appeared before Naruto. It opened itself up and just hovered there, waiting. The first gift is my chakra. Call upon it when you need it. I will be keeping you from using too much of it. You see, my chakra could cause you to lose your mind if you used too much of it right now. As you get older and are able to handle more, I shall grant you more. The scroll you see before you is the second gift. Once you sign it, you will be able to summon Kitsune to do your bidding. Like my chakra, it will take time for you to summon the more powerful ones. Now sign the scroll and accept my power. And if I don't, we both die. Hmm, good point. Naruto bid down on his thumb, went over to the scroll and signed his name. Wise choice, said Kayubi as his red chakra flowed towards Naruto. We shall meet again. Gara found himself in a large dome. That was the best way to explain it. It was a dome made of sand with a small hole at the top. In the middle of the room was a creature that looked like it was made of sand. The creature had its arms, legs, and tail chained down to the ground. He he he, so in trouble are we. Well can let that happen now can we? What to do, what to do? Sand shield protect Gara, but not from this attack. No, no need better power to live, yes he does. The creature continued to rant for some time. After a while Gara came to realize that it was out of its mind. Hey, who are you? What going on? How quickly we forget. Why should I give an answer you already know, silly, silly that what it is. Waste to. Why you waste time? We cannot waste time, if we are to live. Whole tale I give you now. Should save you. Should make you strong. Should help you kill better. Kill the father. Kill the sister. Kill the friend. Leave the monk, we like the book. Yes, yes. All Gara could do was sweat drop and stare at this thing before him. Then all of a sudden the sand began to envelope him. Here you go kitty. Play nice and spill blood. A second before the wind scar could hit the boys, there was a change. A red glow surrounded Naruto and his body began to change. Then in a flash, he was out of the way. Gara, on the other hand, had completely changed into a very, very large sand raccoon. The wind scar hit his new body, but the damage was minimal compared to its size. Inuyasha smiled. Job well done boys, job well done. Time moved on, like it always does. In a blink of an eye, two years passed for the people of the village hidden in the sand. That time seemed to move faster for three young children when they returned from tea country. After Naruto and Gara's near-death experience, Aoi decided to start training to two boys and later Tamari. The first thing she taught the boys was control by walking up building without the use of their hands. In other countries, trees would have been used. However, the wind country happens to be very short on trees so they had to make do. While they were doing that, Aoi worked with Tamari to build up her chakra. Tamari was doing exercises in the morning and meditation at night. A few months later, she had the three of them working on the basics. That's where the problems began. Taijutsu for Gara was difficult due to the sand blocked all of his opponent's attacks causing his natural defense to be weaker than normal. If anything happened to the sand, one good hit would most likely take him out. Naruto and Gara had problems making clones which was one of the most basic skills any ninja should be able to do without any problems. Tamari had a problem with her aim. Her kanai never seemed to hit the target. After seeing their problems, Aoi worked with them on an individual basis. To help with Gara's taijutsu problem, she simply had all his fighting lessons in a clean room. That's right, 
no sand at all. For Tamari, she just needed more training. To fix the problem of both boys, Aoi decided that they needed better chakra control. So one morning, there was an inflatable pool in the middle on the training ground. Ah mom, what is the deal with the pool? Well, the reason why both of your clones are horrible is because you have too much chakra. This is most likely due to the demons that the two of you carry. If this chakra control exercise doesn't help, nothing will. Gara decided to speak up. Is this a swimming lesson? No, I'll be teaching you to walk on water silly. There's no need really, said Gara with a nervous laugh. Oh yes there is. Naruto, you're up first. She explained how to focus his chakra and gave a demonstration. Okay now you try. It took an hour and a half, but Naruto finally managed to get the hang of it. Not bad, not bad at all. Gara, it's your turn. I t think I hear my mother calling. Gara was sweating bullets as he turned around and slowly began to walk away. Naruto, who was still on top of the water, realized what his problem was. Hey, raccoon, shouted Naruto, what's the problem? Scared of the water. Gara turned his head around quickly and gave a death glare at Naruto, it was on. Shut up you stupid fox, so what if I am? Got a problem with that? Oh, I'm stupid? Any idiot could have figured out you were scared by that lame excuse. Your mom is dead. I'll kill you. With that, Gara began to run towards the pool. Just try it, yelled the fox boy as his friend reached the pool. Gara jumped in, forgetting two very important things. The first was that he hadn't mastered walking on water. The second, he couldn't swim. Help! I'm drowning. Gara was thrashing in the water like his life depended on it. Naruto only looked at his friend and let out a small sigh. Gara, said Naruto with a smirk, the water is only waist high. After that, she began to teach some advanced jutsus like sand clones. Training wasn't the only thing that they did. Aoi would never allow that to happen, seeing as you were only young once. She encouraged the three of them to go out and get hobbies and have fun every once in a while. Gara had taken up reading. However his choice of books was considered inappropriate, it turns out that Icha Icha Paradise had left a strong impression on the sand boy. Soon had had the complete series and was writing to its author saying what a genius he was. The only time he wasn't reading the books was when he was training with Aoi so she wouldn't find out. Tamari took up several hobbies. Traditional fan dancing, cooking, collecting dolls, beating up kids for their lunch money, and other things in her free time. However, she also had to take care of her brother since they both lived alone. She also had to do all the shopping because the last time she asked Gara to do it he had bought half of the Icha Icha series with the money. Naruto, like Gara, had also gotten into reading. But, unlike Gara, it wasn't perverted. Naruto had taken up reading mangas. He found them s the time while he waited the three minutes it took for his ramen to heat up. Of course, he hadn't given up on pulling pranks. What Aoi had told the old prevent was true, the people of Hidden Sand didn't hate Naruto. Only about half of the population knew about Naruto and the Kayubi and they respected him more than the Kaze Cage. The reason for this was the deep hatred to the Leaf Village. As time went by, the village lost more and more money to them and more shops began to close. Families who had lived there for generations had no choice but to move to other countries because the daimyo putting all of his money and efforts into other countries rather than his own. So to the people who knew about Naruto were proud to have someone who had landed a heavy blow against the leaf. The others liked him only when they weren't the target of his latest prank. Soon it came time for that special day for all ninja as they took their first step into the real world. The day they entered the academy. Tamari was excited since she hadn't attended the previous year. This is going to be so cool, shouted Naruto when he found out. Sadly, Tamari and Gara were standing right next to him and temporarily lost their hearing. Not so loud, said Tamari as she rubbed her ears. She turned to face Aoi who had been the one who told them the news. Is our father going to be at the entrance ceremony? Yes, but he's only there to give a speech. But don't worry, I'll be standing next to you. That's great, cried Gara. You're a lot better than our father. Now who wants dinner? I cooked tonight. This came from Aoi. The kids looked at her and began to walk away slowly. The next day the four of them arrived at the school grounds. Each hidden village had an academy and they all looked the same. The only thing that made this one different from the others was that it had the symbol of the village on it. 
children from all over the village were there with at least one of their parents. Upon seeing Gara, most of the parents moved their children away from him. Naruto noticed this, but before he could say anything the case cage appeared on the stage in front of the building. I am pleased to see so many young people showing up here today, said the case cage. Know that I respect those of you who are willing to give up their lives so that your village will become stronger. However, not all of you will be able to be able to become shinobi. The daimyo has once again cut back on how many genin we can produce a year. So at the end of the first year, there will be a special exam. What is he talking about mom? asked Naruto. I honestly don't know, replied Aoi. This exam will show us the student who show the most potential as shinobi. After all, it would be a waste to train those who will not be able to make it in this line of work. But, if you are still willing to try again, those who fail will be allowed to try again next year. So study up and get to work. I see, so he's trying to save money, said Aoi to the three. Now, before I go I would like to introduce your new headmaster. I was lucky to get him to work for free. He paused and gave a short laugh that caused everyone to sweat drop. Here he is, Principal Kuno. At that moment, a swirl of sand appeared next to the case cage. When it disappeared, there was a man wearing yellow shorts, a Hawaiian t-shirt, large sunglasses, and a palm tree ponytail. The freak is our principal, asked a girl standing next to Naruto. Aloha. How are the Kiki doing today? Today me be starting as your new headmaster so I bring you da disopline you all need. Class be starting soon and all those late will make statues of me for da week. T this guy, he's insane, explained the same girl. Naruto turned to her and gave her a short nod. Well we better get to class, see you later mom. Okay hope you have some fun, said Aoi to her son. As they trio walked to class, Naruto decided to start making friends. Not just for him, but for Gara and Tamari as well. So he decided to talk to the girl who had been standing next to them since he had never seen her before. She had purple hair that was tied into a single, long ponytail and blue eyes like Naruto's. She was wearing a white shirt with a snake pattern and gray shorts. Hi, I'm Naruto. What's your name? I'm Naga. It's nice to meet you. Who are your friends? This is Gara. Naruto pointed to said redhead, and that's Tamari. He pointed over to the blonde. Have you heard of them? No, she said as she shook her head. Why should I have? Naruto's mind was screaming jackpot. Gara needed more friends than just him, and meeting someone who didn't call him a demon right off the bat would help a great deal. It's nothing, said Gara, who had joined the conversation. So, you like snakes? Yeah, aren't they just the cutest things? The scales, the fangs, the way they inject their venom into their unsuspecting prey. As she said this her eyes got all starry. My dream is to be like the great snake Sanin Orochimaru, he is just so cool. By this time they were in the class and decided to take their seats. Each row in the classroom had three tables and three seats to each. Naruto, Gara, and Tamari decided to sit next to each other in the same row. Naga sat in the row above them. They continued to chat until their sensei walked into the room. Silence shouted an old woman with a long nose, thing of the main witch from the movie Witch, if you haven't seen it well CIT it's good. Before we begin class, I am going to be discussing how the end of the year exam to you will all have plenty of time. The case cage has decided to hold a tournament at the end of the year. You will all be competing against each other in a series of one-on-one -on -one matches. Now we aren't going to keep the winners, but the students who show the most skill with jutsus. You will have one year to learn as many jutsus as you can with your families as well as the ones in class. The only people who will not be competing will be the ones who can't do a simple transformation jutsu or a clone jutsu. Yes, a question. What about those of us who don't come from ninja families, asked Naga. Well, there is always the library. This is a test of your will and dedication. Those of you who go through this halfway will not be here next year. Only the top nine of you will be continuing your studies. This is not a joke. Naruto began to smile a bit. What better motivation to improve than a tournament that would decide a person's future? Who knows, he might get to fight Gara. They had fought before, but always in controlled conditions and never had they gone all out. Naruto began to look around the room. Some of the kids looked really depressed. Others looked like they wanted to leave right then and there. Well, I better fix this he thought as he turned to his sensei. Well, what are you waiting for? shouted Naruto. Let's get to work. You seem eager. 
You do realize that this won't be a walk in the park? Of course, explained the blonde. That's why I want this. Anything that you can get easily isn't worth it. He's right, said Gara. Who wants something that is just handed to you? I'll show you all why I'm ready to be a San Shinobi. With that all the students began to regain the confidence. Naruto had that effect on people. It was like he could lift people's spirits just by saying what was in his heart. And it always worked. Well, said their sensei, this is going to be interesting to say the least. With that they began their lesson. This sucks, cried Naga as she threw down the scroll she was reading. It had been a week since the announcement that only nine students would be able to continue at the end of the year. Only a few months for them to learn something that could impress the judges and show that they had what it took to become a shinobi. However, Naga came from a family that had no history of being shinobi. She would have to learn and train on her own since everyone in the class were regarding each other as enemies. Well, almost everyone. It's okay Naga, said Naruto as he patted her on the back. A village library, trying to learn new skills that they could learn. The problem for Naruto was that nothing he found was interesting or too common. Naga wanted to learn something that would reflect her love for snakes. That's easy for you to say. Your mom is head of the Anbu. She can help you out with tons of stuff. Naga picked up another scroll, the inner shinobi in you, and began to skim it. Naruto chuckled. That may be true, but I'm not suited for her jutsus. Believe me, I've tried. He stopped to make a note on combining genjutsu with ninjutsu that he found interesting. Those boomerangs just don't compare to my katana. Naga was about to say something, but a black book caught her eye. It was had a leather cover and had the kanji for bingo. What's this? she asked picking up the book. Naruto glanced at the book. That's the bingo book. It contains information on all shinobi that we should be aware of. Here let me show you. Naruto picked up the book and turned it Hiyashi Hayuga. This is the head of the Hayuga. On this page we have information on what he is most famous for. Things like his bloodline limit, jutsus, and fighting style. Naga took the book and began to read about the Hayuga. Naruto decided to start on a new scroll that gave helpful hints on creating new jutsus. The information contained was very difficult and he decided to ask his mom later. Wow, it says here that they can shut off the chakra flow in their opponent's body. I wonder what else they can do. I don't think the Hayuga clan has anything else. That's how those old clans work. They're so focused on keeping their traditions intact that they never evolve their style. Or at least that's what my mom tells me. Naga nodded. I see, well I think I got an idea. She grabbed a couple of scrolls on chakra control and went to check them out. Naruto decided to do the same. He grabbed his scrolls and went over to the checkout desk. Over the next few months the class worked hard. Each person went straight home to work with their families on a jutsu they could use for the final. Some had come to class with bruises, burns, and several other types of injuries. Some even missed class due to chakra depletion. Naruto, Gara, and Tamari were no exception. Naruto trained with the Kitsunsaiga, trying to use its special powers, creating a few jutsus of his own, and working on his summoning. Gara focused on his control of the sand and going into his giant form. Tamari had gotten a giant fan and was practicing using it with some wind jutsu with it with the help of Kagura who came over to visit. Finally, the day came. 24 cadets arrived at the battle area where the final test of the Chunin exam was held in the hidden sand. They went to stand in the middle while people filled in the stadium. The betting pool was in overdrive. Not only was the son of the K's cage competing, but the son of Anbu chief, and several others from various clans that had proud traditions. Principal Kuna appeared in front of them with a mic in his hand. Aloha. How's everybody be doing today? Now Big Kahuna tell all ya da rules. Ya be fighting till death or unable to fight no more. Over da are the judges that will be deciding how ya do. We also have your future John and senseis. Me give ya all da best of luck me kiki. Now look up at da board and we see who have da first match. With that an electronic board began to go flash random names until it stopped at two. Well, will this be exciting? Will Gara and Taiki please remain on the field? Da rest of you Kiki please move to the observation box and wait ya turn. Everyone began to move toward the stairs that would lead them to their box. Naruto gave his best friend a look that said, don't you dare lose before our match before going. Gara looked at his opponent. He had on glasses and had short silver hair. 
He was wearing what appeared to be a black high school uniform that gave him a nerdy aura. Gara himself was wearing a black outfit without his gourd. He had checked out the area earlier and didn't have to worry about a lack of sand. Well, looks like I'm in luck, said Taiki as he pushed up his glasses. Today I'll defeat you with my skills and continue my education at the academy. Why don't you do us both a favor and quite now? Gara crossed his arms. Are you trying to talk me to death or what? Begin, shouted Kuno. I'll start first. Witness my amazing skills. With that Taiki began to form several seals. Ultimate fireball jutsu, he yelled. Gara tensed, ready for a blast of fire from his opponent. However, only a small flame came out of the mouth of Taiki that was barely larger than the flame of a candle. Everyone face faulted, including the case cage. What was that? asked Naruto in the box, his eye was twitching. It took him all year just to learn that, said an annoyed Tamari. She turned to Naruto. I hope Gara makes this quick. Naruto answered with a nod. What was that? asked Gara as he got up from his face fault. There is nothing ultimate about that. Taiki brought up his hand to fix his glasses again. Please, you are just jealousy of my amazing skills. Soon, all the nations will know and fear my name as I defeat all who stand in my way. With that he lifted his head back and began to laugh. Gara sighed and uncrossed his arms and reached to grab something from his back pocket. Taiki noticed this and got into a poor taijutsu stance. Gara whipped out his Icha Icha Paradise Volume 13 and began to read causing his opponent to face fault this time. You're not even worth my attention, said Gara before his eyes went wide and started to drool. No one ignores me, shouted his opponent as he began to charge. However, as he got close to Gara, the sand in the stadium grabbed his leg. He he, little fool, thought Shukaku. You know, take the book, the precious. It is ours. With that, the sand began to lift him by the leg and swirl him around Gara. Then, after two minutes, it let go, sending him into a wall. Before he fell to the ground he said, I'll get you for this, after that, he passed out. Kuno ran to the middle of the ring and shouted, Da winner, Gara." When Gara got up to the box and saw Naruto giving him a smirk, Gara just shrugged, it wasn't as if he wanted to fight someone that weak. Okay now me student, Da big kahuna got the next set for fighters for ya all. Will Takeshi and Riko please come to the floor? Both fighters entered the ring. Riko was dressed in a dessert camouflage sweatpants and similar style long sleeve t shirt. Under her sleeves, there were retractable blades on each arm and on her boots as well. Her hair was black, long, and spiky, and her eyes were also black. Takeshi was dressed light in comparison. He was wearing a simple red shirt and gray shorts. His head had a buzzed cut and his eyes were also black. I'm a bit scared right now, said the nervous boy. Don't worry, said his opponent, it'll be over soon. Begin. At the sound of Kuno, both jumped away from each other. They appeared to be assessing each other as they got into a fighting stance. Rico decided to make the first move and began to charge. Her first punch didn't connect, which was lucky for Takeshi because as she punched her blade came out. Shit, he thought, one hit and this will be over, as Rico began a series of punches. Takeshi tried to get some distance again. It was clear to him that was had been training with taijutsu. Time to show them what I can do. With that he dashed over to the cactuses while forming a series of hand signs. When he got there, his hand hit the largest one and he shouted, Needle assault jutsu. Suddenly, all of the needles on the cactus shot out of it, on the side not facing him, at high speed. Rico tried to get out of the way, but several hit her left arm. Ouch, that hurts, she mumbled. I better watch out if B does that again or I'm out. Or better yet, I'll take out his ammo first. With that she once again charged at her opponent. Halfway to him, she did a sort of jump twist that made her look like she was doing a cartwheel on her side in the air. Human shirikal of her blades came out. Yikes, cried Takeshi as he jumped out of the way of the attack. The attack sliced through the cactuses and she went right into the all. When the dust cleared, both of her leg blades were stuck in the wall. He gave her a look that just yelled what was the point of that attack. Don't say a word, said Rico. I just have a small problem stopping. She tried to become unstuck, but it was useless. She had lost. A small problem. Da winner, Takeshi, said Kuno suddenly. Now while we help Da small Kiki, let's see who be fighting next. 
Both Naruto and Tamari were both crossing their fingers, hoping that one of them would be next. Alrighty then. Would Kyo and Makoto Fuafua please come down to the stage? Kyo and Makoto entered the ring. Kyo was dressed in a gray vest and blue short. His orange hair was cut in a mohawk and his eyes were colored teal. Makoto Fuafua was dressed in a black shirt with bright red buttons going down the center and tan shorts. On his back was his clan's seal, an orange sun like the rest of his clan. He had short brown hair and mercury colored eyes that was similar to the Hyuga clan. Ah, said the case cage to Aoi. I have been waiting for one our village's clans to fight. The Fuafua clan is very skilled, commented Aoi. I wonder how much this boy has learned. Begin. Kyo began instantly with a series of hand symbols. Mountain Breeze Jutsu. Nothing happened and Makoto wondered if there was something wrong, until he started to feel dizzy. I'm a wind user, said Kyo with a smile. This move is one of the most simple wind type jutsus out there. What it does is thin out the air around my opponent. The effect is that you feel like you are on top of a mountain. Makoto answered him with one word, flare. Suddenly, a blinding light came out of his eyes. Kyo instinctively moved his hands top shield his eyes, cancelling the jutsus. Makoto took that moment to charge at his opponent and land a powerful punch in the stomach. The Fuafua clan's bloodline limit, the Eryxia Manishan, said the case cage. Those eyes of theirs allow them to see perfectly, even in complete darkness. They also gather sunlight and release it in a sudden burst. The combine this blinding with taijutsu to defeat their opponents. A little cheap for my tastes, commented Aoi. But, then again, all's fair in love and war. Okay this match is over. Da winner is Makoto Fuafua. Kuno looked over to the board. The next match will be Masaru versus Nori. Give the big bad kahuna something to cheer about. Masaru looked like he came prepared. He was covered with pockets and pouches that had kanai and shuriken. Half of his face was covered with long black hair that allowed his left jade colored eye to be seen. His opponent, a plump blonde with gray eyes, was dressed in blue shorts and a teal colored top. Begin. Masaru threw five shurikens to start. Nori dogged them and landed on his side facing away from Masaru. Masaru waited for his opponent to move, but he did move an inch. Playing a possum, he thought as he took out a kanai. However, the kanai began to dissolve into maggots. What the, he started to say but didn't finish as he saw the rest of the world around him dissolving into worms, maggots, flies, and other types of creepy crawlers. Well, that's what he saw at least. In reality, he was asleep. Nori's genjutsu had worked. Da winner. Oh, so exciting. Let's see who be next. Oh my, it's Ryu Itami and Masuyo. Well, this will be short. Indeed it will, said the case cage. All members of the Atami clan eventually become members of the Anbu or Hunter Nin. All because of the special brand of jutsu that they use. Ryu entered the ring first. He had long braided silver hair that went down to his waist. He was dressed in a white Chinese fighting outfit that had a red dragon on it that matched his eyes. His opponent, Masuyo, had blonde, flat, hair and green eyes. He was wearing a gray long sleeve shirt and blue pants. Let's have some fun said Ryu with a grin. His opponent said nothing as Kuno singled the beginning of the match. Then, he was suddenly moving around Ryu at an impressive speed for his age. I see, thought Ryu. He has been concentrating on a hit and run strategy. Well, that won't work on me. Ryu began to do some hand signs and shouted, heavy pressure jutsu. Masuyo began to slow down, as if a hundred pounds had been added on top of him. He then got down on his hands and knees, sweating. What did you do to me? asked Masuyo slowly. What kind of ninja would I be if I told you? was the only answer that was given to him. Well now, it looked like this fight over, said the insane principal. Now we see who be next. Oh my, next is the eldest child of the K's cage, Tamari, versus Yu Yudai. I don't know who to cheer for, sighed Gara as the two fighters got into the ring. What do you mean? asked Naruto loudly. You should cheer for your sister. That's obvious, even for me. Yeah, but you is so cute. Also, I heard my dad is planning an arranged marriage for me with her. At this, Gara began to tear up. I think my dad is starting to warm up to me. Ah, oh, I don't know about that. If my mom did something like that for me, I'd be upset. 
Down on the field, Tamari and Yu were having a pre-flight staring contest. Tamari was dressed in a plain white skirt and shirt and had a large fan on her back. Her hair was tied into three ponytails. Yu looked dazzling. The face of an angel, long pink hair, and ocean blue eyes. Yu was dressed in a neon pink battle kimono with black, metal battle fans on each side. Hello Tamari, said Yu in a silky voice. I hope you will be a decent challenge so I can impress Gara. You like my brother? Oh my, said Yu and soon Yu began to squirm. This is so embarrassing. I can't wait to hold him in my arms and stroke that messy red head of his. Then I'll look into those tired eyes of his and then, giggle. We can do this and that. Like I'll let you do anything like that to my brother you sick freak. If you can't guess, she's shouting. Well, I could move over to Naruto. He's also very sexy, but his loud voice is so annoying. Oh, that's it, said a red-faced Tamari. I have been meaning to do this for a while. She took off her fan and slammed it into the ground. Hey, Tamari, shouted Gara. what do you have against her? I guess you all don't know, she pointed to you, but you here is a boy. At this, most of the audience sweat dropped. Naruto and Gara, on the other hand turned to stone. Yu's replay to this was simply giving the audience a wink. Yu pulled out his fans. One had the kanji for cold on it, while the other had hot inscribed on it. Hope you're ready. Yu swung the fan that said hot, burning gust. A red gust of wind was sent towards Tamari. When it hit her, it pushed her back a few feet and gave her a very light burn. Oh my, better cool you down. He swung the old fan. Icy breeze. This time, a blue gust hit her sending her back several more feet and causing her to shiver. How do you like it? My family make these chakra weapons and sells them to the highest bidder. All a user has to do is place some of his or her chakra in them and they can do these kinds of attacks without the fuss of hand signs. This helps keep my hands nice and smooth. Take this, dust wind jutsu. Using her giant fan, Tamari created a huge windstorm and sent you flying more than a few feet. You landed face first in the sand, but got back up quickly. Hey, you got sand in my hair, wind you. I'll make sure you can't do that again. Take this, burning gust. Another red blast of air came towards Tamari, burning her and her fan. When she got up she saw that the paper part of her fan had hundreds of small burn holes in it, making it useless. Crap, my fan is ruined, thought Tamari. How can I beat this asshole when my fan is like this? Wait a minute, I can do that, Tamari the closed her fan and began to charge at you. When she got halfway there she was hit with another icy breeze, but she kept going. Once she got into striking range landed a hard blow to Yu's side. Yu flew to the ground, hard. Kuno then went over to check on Yu. Seeing that he was in no condition to fight, or move, he declared Tamari the winner. How did you win? asked Yu. Your weapon was rendered useless. A true shinobi doesn't rely on weapons alone. Besides, the metal holder of my fan could still be used. You shot her a dirty look. Stupid weasel girl. Somewhere far, far away, Misao Makimachi suddenly shouted, I am not a weasel. Okay now that was a weird fight now wasn't it, said Kuno. Next we have Ran versus Shinobu Kayui. When Tamari got back up to the balcony she found that both boys were still cased in stone. I can't believe they never noticed, was all she said. She looked down and saw both Kunoichi had entered the battlefield. Ran had both green hair and eyes and was dressed in a brown spandex jumpsuit. Shinobu had red hair and dull red eyes. For hairstyle think Shinobu from Love Hina, she was dressed in a light grey jacket and blue shorts. Ah, excuse me, said the shy Kaiyui heiress, but what is with the spandex? Oh, well I wanted green, but some jerk bought all of them in every size. Meanwhile, Guy was starting to sneak up on his target. Then all of a sudden, he sneezed three times. This alerted his enemy to his presence. Oh shit, said Guy. Ladies, begin. Ran began quickly as she threw a smoke bomb on the ground. Shinobu tensed up and searched for her opponent in the smoke. Where will she come from? The front, sides, or maybe from behind, or perhaps above. Suddenly she had Ran shout, in her decapitation jutsu as she was pulled into the ground. When the smoke cleared she saw her spandex-clad opponent standing above her. Looks like I win, said Ran. Not yet, replied Shinobu while she stared at Ran's feet. 
Ran looked down and coming out of the sand were hundreds of small red dots that were crawling onto her. She looked over at Shinobu and saw that these same red dots were lifting her out of the ground slowly. What's going on here? This is what my clan is known for, said Shinobu meekly. We are similar to the Aburame or the Kamazuru clan, but we use a different type of insect. We use fire ants. Now, please don't more or else my ants will think you are trying to hurt them and they will bit. Trust me, it will be very painful. Ran was now covered from the neck down. Yes, it would be very painful if they all bit at once. I give up. As soon as Ran said that, all of the bugs began to return to Shinobu. All right then, said Kuno. Now, let's see who be next. Why it's Ryota Chikusho versus Natsumi. Both fighters entered the ring. Natsumi, who had long black hair and blue eyes, was wearing a pink shirt and skirt with bandages on both arms. Ryota was dressed in a black pants and long sleeve shirt. On his elbows were metal spikes. His eyes were covered by oval sunglasses and his hair was a dark blue. Begin. Instantly, Ryota bit his thumb and then slammed it into the ground. I summon the two chow. From the ground, three claw marks shot out towards Natsumi. When she dodged them, they came back towards its master and waited for more orders. Like it, asked Ryota with a smirk. It's called beast magic and my clan is the last clan still practicing it. Right now I can only summon one low level demon at a time, but it's enough for this fight. So, panted Natsumi, you just get others to fight for you, I'll show you what I learned. She made several hand signs. Lightning arrow, suddenly, a bow made of lightning formed in her right hand. She the pulled back on the string with her left hand and an arrow appeared. Take this, she said as she let go. The arrow shot towards Ryota, but his demon moved in and took the hit. It was destroyed instantly. Nice try, said Ryota. You use lightning for long distance attacks. But there is a flaw, your chakra limit. How many do you have left? Want to keep going and find out? Natsumi then charged with her right fist back ready to strike, however, Ryota slammed his fist on the ground once more. I summoned the two chow, with that, three more clams came out of the ground and rushed towards Natsumi. They were about to hit her when a blue flash interfered and grabbed her. Principal Kuno, asked a shocked Ryota, what are you doing? That would have killed this poor Kiki, so dis match be over y'all. Kuno patted Natsumi on the head. You did your best so don't worry. Now, let's see who we have next on Da board. Machiko and Moriko come on down. At that moment, Naruto began to show to move again. She's a he, he stammered. Tamari rolled her eyes and sighed. Welcome back idiot, she said. Looks like you're last. Back on the field Moriko and Machiko had already stared the fight with Taijutsu. Moriko had light blue hair with two long bangs in the front and green eyes. She was dressed in a green battle kimono. Machiko had short black hair and black eyes. He was dressed in a blue one piece outfit. Moriko suddenly jumped back and then pulled out a rose. No Karama, it isn't Rose Whip. She pumped some chakra into it and threw it at her opponent, shouting, Rose Dart. With that, the fight was over as they hit their opponent. So, Sumi, I want to finish this chapter up. If it make you feel any better, Machiko was going to try to use an earth jutsu, but never got the chance. Well, that was fast, said Kuno. Well we only have two fighters left, so come on down Naga and Naruto. Naga and Naruto quickly got to the fighting area. Naruto was now wearing a black shirt with a red fox on the front and the sand village symbol on his sleeves and black pants with large pockets. Strapped on his back was his katana. The stood in front of each other, smiling like idiots. So Naruto, are you ready to have some fun? Well I hope so, did you learn anything during this year? Begin, shouted Kuno. What do you think, she said to Naruto. Naga got into a stance that resembled the gentle fist style. Her hands began to glow purple. Then a series of blows came towards him, each one a narrow miss. Don't tell me you're pulling an Uchiha on me, said Naruto as he dodged the blows. A copy is never as good as the original. Then a single blow hit his left arm, and it went numb. Then, a few seconds later, he couldn't move it at all. He jumped back and stared at her. Who said I copied them, said Naga. True, I got the idea of pushing chakra into my opponent from them, but that's where it ends. This is my own fighting style I call Venom Dance. Ya see, my parents aren't shinobi, 
but they use chakra needles with acupuncture. They drink a special muscle relaxer formula and mix it with their chakra. I'm doing something similar, it's just that my hands are covered with hundreds of small needles and I'm mixing my chakra with poison. I have sent the entire year building up a tolerance to several different types. I'm impressed, said Naruto as he clutched his arm, waiting for Kayubi to heal it. If anyone deserves to continue being a student, it's you. Thanks, now let's fight, with that she charged again, ready to strike. Naruto dodged them and kept trying to gain distance as the fox slowly got rid of the poison. I see you're trying to buy yourself time, said Naga. Sorry, but that poison will stay in your system for at least, she was cut off as his left fist gazed her cheek. What? But how? I'm a fast healer, said Naruto smugly, now let me show you something original. Kitsune style. Fox fire whip. In his hand, a bright red flame appeared. Naruto closed his hand and the flame stretched itself and formed a whip. Just because I have a katana on my back doesn't mean that's the only weapon I can use. Besides, this weapon will help me keep you at a distance. Now let's get it on, with that, Naruto began to lash out at Naga. Naruto proved to be incredibly effective with the whip as each of his attacks were barely avoided. Great, thought Naga. Thanks to that whip, I can't get close enough to touch him. Then, her luck ran out as the fire whip hit her side and wrapped around her waist. The flames began to burn tea burn her skin. Naruto then gave the whip a sharp and powerful pull that sent Naga flying towards him. When she got close enough her face meet his left fist in a very painful manner, knocking her out cold. Okay Kiki. Da winner is Naruto. The next round will begin in half an hour so y'all better be back now, ya here. I can't believe that my fan is ruined, cried Tamari. That half an hour was almost up and the remaining fighters were getting ready to continue. Naruto and Gara were the only two that weren't low on chakra, so they were taking it easy. At least you can still hit stuff, said Naruto trying to be helpful. All Gara did was giggle as he ready his book. The caused his sister and best friend to sweat drop. All right my Kiyakis come on back to the arena, it'd be time for round two. As soon as the students heard this, they made their way to where they could find their Hawaiian headmaster. When they got to the arena, it had changed. There was a large wall that split it in half. They all wondered what was going on until Principal Kuno began to speak again. Here is how Da second round goes. There are ten of you left. You will be split into two groups that will fight until last man or woman standing. Then wall comes down and the two winners fight to see who wins third round. So, said Tamari, the right after this, the winners fight in the finally round, with no break, that is so unfair. Life not always fair child. Now, group 1 will consist of Gara, Takeshi, Makoto, Nori, and Ryu. The second group will be Tamari, Shinobu, Ryota, Moriko, and Naruto. Alright let's get group 2 into their half, shall we? As the second group was being moved into their half, the case cage and Aoi were having a little chat. So, how is everyone betting? asked the case cage, his smile hidden behind his mask. Not bad, replied Aoi. Looks like the bets are split almost in half. Half for Gara and half for Naruto. There are a couple odd choices, but the odds are highly against them. So, who are you betting on? Gara, of course. He began to sweat drop when he turned to see Aoi begin to cry. I never believed I would live to see this day. It's about time you opened up to your son and showed him love. That's what he needs, love. He needs his daddy to hold him and tell him that he is a good son. Aoi began to imagine that scene his father and son ran into each other's arms and began to hug. A waterfall appeared behind them. Are you high? I hate that little monster. I just want the money. I mean, if Chunin and Lo Janin can't beat my son, then none of these brats can. Of course, there is Naruto who also has a demon in him, but this is Gara's element. He said this calmly, as if it was natural. This made Aoi very angry. Before she could say anything, they heard Kuno, who was on top of the wall, shout, begin. On Gara's side, all the fighters decided to target Gara first. Takeshi, Makoto, and Nori all ran towards Gara with Kanai drawn. Gara made a few hand symbols and said, Sand clone jutsu. Suddenly, three Garas made of sand appeared in front of them. Deciding to risk it, they charged at them and plunged the Kanais into them, expecting them to puff. However, unlike other clone, sand clones don't puff. 
Shocked by this, they didn't react in time to the clones grabbing them by the shoulders with their left hand and placing their right hand a foot away from their chests. San Shuriken Jutsu! shouted Gara as balls of sand shot out of the clones' right hands and impacted the three in the chest. The three feel down, leaving Ryu alone with Gara. Not bad, said Ryu. You took those three down faster than I thought you would, but, it doesn't matter anymore. You should be running low on chakra by now. Heavy pressure jutsu. With that, Gara began to feel like weights were slowly being added to him. Well, I better use that jutsu, said Gara. He began to run through hand signs and stopped. Tanuki style. Icha Icha world jutsu. Suddenly Ryu wasn't in sand anymore. The world he was in was had staircases that went into the sky and doors floating in the sky. There were fountains that poured out wine and sake. Other than that, there was nothing but the ground below him. Or at least, that what Ryu believed. Welcome, came a young female voice from behind him. Ryu turned around and found a girl about 14 years old with short light blue hair and red eyes. She was wearing a light see-through nightgown. H. Hi, he stammered. It was then realized that his body had changed as well. He was taller and more matured. Probably at the same level as the girl in front of him. What is going on? Would you like to become one with me? One in mind, body and soul? I think it would be very nice. As she said this she slowly walked over. As soon as she was close enough she reached out and placed her hand on his check. She then began to move in closer for a kiss when she was interrupted. Wait, said a woman with purple hair and a tight black dress and a red jacket. I think he might like them older. I am, after all, more experienced. Hey stupid, said another girl with red hair and blue eyes. I think I like you, your mind so get used to it. In the real world only a second had passed. Ryu was on the ground, stuck in a genjutsu. Gara, who was now free from the jutsu, smirked. This was the jutsu he used to trap prevents in a world no sane man would ever want to leave. Do I really need to say more? On the other side of the wall, Naruto was just finishing up. Like what had happened to Gara, he had been rushed by most of his opponents, except Tamari. She had decided to watch for the moment and wait until she saw her chance. As the three came towards him, he made a series of hand signs and shouted, Perfect sand clone jutsu. Ten Naruto clones appeared, but they looked just like Naruto, color and all. This caused Shinobu, Ryota, and Moriko to stop dead in their tracks. Which one is the real one? asked Ryota. Getting no answer, B decided to use a summon to take care of this. I summon the two Chao. The demon charged at one of the Naruto's who just stood there. When the demon hit it, the genjutsu on it disappeared revealing a normal sand clone, but on it was an exploding note that went off. The demon was destroyed. Like them, said one of the Naruto's. Sure, one hit and the genjutsu disappears. However, they can conceal something very dangerous. With that the clones charged at the three who stood there in shock. Three clones targeted each of them and were quickly dealt with. Soon it was just Tamari and Naruto. Tamari went over what she could do. All her jutsus used her giant fan and her genjutsu was poor. That left taijutsu. So, she charged swinging her fan at Naruto. However, Naruto unsheathed his katana from his back and with a single swing sliced her weapon in half. Tamari began to fall back. Seeing this, Naruto shifted his weapon into his left and sent his free fist into her gut. Sorry Tamari said Naruto to a passed out Tamari. Chunin entered the ring and began to grab the fallen while the wall began to dissolve. It happened very slowly and made everyone anxious. Would that thing hurry up, complained Naga, who was now up in the stands. Let's go Gara. let's go, cheered Yu who was now dressed in a girl's cheerleader outfit. He was jumping up and down like a complete idiot, causing several people to sweat drop. Naga got on her knees and began to pray. Kami, please. If I make it to Genin, please don't put me on the same team as this nut job. No one deserves that. When the wall finally disappeared, Naruto and Gara were left staring at each other. The wind began to pick up, as if nature itself was expecting this fight. Inside the two of them, their demons were restless as well. Kayubi and Shukaku wanted to see how well their vessels could handle each other. Kuno was about to speak, but Naruto stopped him. Principal Kuno, if you don't mind, I would like to bring in a special judge for this fight. Naruto then bit his thumb and made a couple of hand signs. 
summoning jutsu. White smoke appeared in the STF nowhere, a drum roll started. Then searchlights appeared. Suddenly a girl with brown hair, green eyes, and a fox's ears and tail jumped out of the smoke carrying a microphone. Here she is, cried the girl, your hostess, Koto. Believe me, it's good to be back in the world or competitive fighting. Koto is a low-class kitsune whose only talent is judging fights. Don't worry, she is 100% neutral. Naruto turns to Gara and tosses him a soldier pill from his pocket and begins to eat one himself. All right, said Koto as she pushes Kuno away. Here are the rules. You fight until your opponent is dead or unable to continue. I get to decide if a fighter is unable to continue and my word is final. Oh, I hope you two cut loose and spill a lot of blood. Just thinking of that makes my knees weak. All right, third match begin. Hey Gara, let's do a warm up first. Naruto let out his foxy smile. Sexy jutsu. Suddenly, half of the men in the audience, and a few of the women, were knocked out due to major blood loss. Not bad, said Gara. Now let's see how you do against this. Wet and sexy jutsu. Gara then transformed into a young and busty woman with long wet red hair dressed only in a white bathrobe. This caused more people to pass out. All right, shouted Naruto. Take this, harem jutsu. With that, twenty naked female Naruto's appeared. Cosplay jutsu. Gara was now dressed in female form in a tight nurse's outfit. Not much of the stadium was left conscious. Would you two idiots stop messing around? shouted Koto. Where is the blood, the punching, and so on? In a puff of smoke, Naruto and Gara were back to normal and ready to fight each other seriously now. Gara made the first move as he sent several blasts of sand towards Naruto. Naruto dodged them with a series of flips. Gara then placed a hand on the sand and said, Tanuki style. Sand spike jutsu. With that, the sand began to form together into many large spikes that seemed to be directed at Naruto. Acting quickly, Naruto unsheathed his katana and began to spin around like a top. This move allowed him to cut off the pointy ends of the spikes. This is amazing, exclaimed Koto. Gara, who normally sticks to defense, is doing all the attacking while Naruto, whose strength is offense, is only defending himself. What a battle. I just wish that more people could see this. Wait, what's this? It seems like both fighters has stopped. Indeed they had. They seem to be in staring contest. At least to the untrained eye. In reality, they were sizing each other up. They were looking for any weakness they could find in the other. Gara's was his dependency on the sand, but it would be very difficult to get rid of an entire desert and still have enough chakra to fight. Naruto had no known long-range attacks and few defenses against them. But, his stamina and healing powers made up for those weaknesses. Hey Gara, let's take this fight to the next level. About time. As soon as Gara said that, a dun of sand appeared around him. He was going into his demon form. As Naruto waited, his whiskers began to grow larger, his hands turned into claws, and his eyes turned red and slit. A few moments later, Gara came out in his mini tanuki form. It doesn't take as much time as it does when he wants to get big. Unbelievable, cried Koto. Both combatants are now using their demon powers. My senses tell that they are both using base level demon powers. I can't wait to see this carnage. At that, both of them charged at each other. When they got close, Naruto swung his katana at Gara, but was blocked by his tail. Then, quickly, he slammed one of his clawed sandy fists into Naruto, sending him several yards away. Naruto then got back up and gave out a laugh. Wow, we have never gone all out like this before, said Naruto. That's because of your mom. She always stops us when things start to heat up. Well, enough small talk. Summoning Jutsu. Once the smoke cleared away, there stood the Chibi Five. They're what I called the five kitsunes the Shippo meets. Hey boss, said the leader. What do you need, just to take him out, said Naruto pointing at Gara. The Chibi Five turned and looked at Gara. Then the turned to face Naruto again and gave him a scared look. Ah, sorry boss. We don't think so. With that, they began to dig into the earth and vanished. With a sigh Naruto swung the Kitsunsaiga and shouted, Kitsun wave. From the blade came a wave of red chakra in the shape of a fox's head. Its mouth opened as it neared Gara. In a panic, Gara shouted, 
tanuki style drilling air bullet a giant bullet of air came out of his mouth and went head on with the red chakra the two attacks collided and exploded creating a huge dust storm before gara could get his bearings he saw naruto coming towards him through the dust i see he used that attack to distract me he must have been behind that attack so if i countered it he would be on me in seconds as naruto neared his friend he heard him say tanuki style desert coffin with that naruto found himself constricted by the sand well folks if you blinked you missed one sweet attack exclaimed kodo but it looks like it's over as gara has naruto stuck in some sort of sand cocoon it's more like a coffin said gara so naruto ready to give i know you put a lot of your chakra into that attack you don't have much left and i can use the other jutsu i developed that goes along with this one if you don't quit well i think i still have a shot right boys with that the chibi five shot out of the earth and bit into each of his arms legs and the side of his neck didn't you find it odd that they didn't puff out like other summons give up gara and i'll tell them to let go if you don't they'll only bit harder so a game of chicken fine i'll play tanuki style desert funeral with that the sand around naruto began to compress at the same time all five kitsunes bit down even harder causing gara to scream in pain and release his jutsu before it could finish both fighters fell to the ground and their transformed states vanished koto moved over to the two fallen fighters and checked them out both fighters are unable to continue this match is a draw what shouted the case cage how can this be how can he lose wow said Aoi. i won the betting pool what yeah i bet that this would end in a tie the odds were 700 to 1 and i won with that Aoi began laughing like a maniac later that night Aoi and the gang were out at the last ramen stand in the village the rest had been closed due to the high taxes the daimyo had placed they were all laughing about what had happened today until a dark-haired teenager they had never seen came up to them. Hello, he said simple. I saw that last match and was very impressed. Thanks, said Naruto after he slurped up him noodles. He then noticed that this guy had a leaf forehead protector with the leaf symbol on it. There was a slash running right through it. Are you from the leaf village? Was, he said simple. I got tired of all those weaklings holding me back. Now I'm just looking to find something that will push me further. He paused for a moment and then continued. That fight was excellent. You too, he points at Naruto and Gara. Remind me of myself when I was younger. So much potential and power. Yeah, said Gara. Getting attacked by Chunin every day will do that to a guy. How many has it been so far? asked Naruto. Gara pulled out a small notepad. About 97. He looked up to see the teenager leaving. Hey, you leaving so soon? Got to, he said not turning around. By the way, the name is Itachi. With that he left. No one there knew that only two days ago had had killed his entire family. Master Naruto, cried an old voice. Everyone looked around, trying to find the source of the voice until they saw a small dot on Naruto's nose begin to get bigger. When Naruto noticed this, he swatted Mioga. What's the matter Mioga? Inuyasha throw you out or something. No, this is a V said the old flea demon. This concerns Lord Sesamaru's mother, the four-tailed demon. What about her? asked Aoi. Whoever said life was fair? That is something we say or are told many times in our lives. What makes us think that it ever was in the first place? When we suddenly don't get what we want or lose something we care about, there are some who go through life and never once complain that life isn't fair. They are the people who have never had any fairness to begin with, so they are not deluded enough to ever believe that it could ever be fair. A small girl in the village of Koyama was one of those people. She was dressed only in a potato sack and nothing more. Her hair, which was pure white, had many blood stains in it from her countless beatings. She had a crescent blue moon on her forehead that matched her eyes. Her role, as she knew it, was that of slavery. In the morning her handler would wake her up from her dog cage and was give a slice of bread and water. Then she was told which house had hired her services for the day. Each day and job varied. Some people wanted her to scrub their floors, pull weeds, and do other various tasks that any child could do. Others, however, paid to barrow her so they could whip, beat, choke, and do many other horrible things to her. So life was not fair for her. Especially now, 
as she watched children in the park playing with their parents. This was the hardest part of her day because the park was always en route to where her handler lived. Every day she would have to walk by and could not help see this spot where children could run and play freely while she could not. She then looked at the sky and saw that it was getting dark, she decided to stop watching and go back to her cage to sleep. As she walked by the park, the girl saw four odd strangers walking towards her. Two of them had blonde hair, one had red, and the tallest of them had blue. The one with the blue hair was yelling at the redhead for reading dirty books while the other two had sweat drops on their heads and were keeping quiet. Fearing for herself, the girl quickly moved to hide behind a trash barrel. She had learned that when someone was yelling, hitting would soon follow. As they got closer, she could more easily hear what they were saying. And that is why reading those book will lead you to swearing, said Aoi. Gara simply rolled his eyes to this and kept reading his book. So, said Tamari, anyone know who we're looking for? That stupid flea didn't, Naruto stopped dead in his tracks and let out his famous foxy smile. No pranking while we're here Naruto, said Aoi. We're treating this like a mission, so there will be no room for that kind of stuff. Not that mom. I just remembered I have to do something alone for a bit. I'll meet you all at the hotel in a little bit. At this, Gara pulled his face away from his orange book and gave him an odd look. Tamari and Aoi exchanged glances that asked each other what kind of trouble will he get us in. I'm just going to get you a present mom, said the kitsune container. At that, his mother started jumping up and down like a little schoolgirl and asked her son what he was going to get her. His only reply was that she would have to wait till she had a hotel room to find out. With that, she grabbed Tamari and Gara by the back of their shirts and left only a dust imprint of them in her wake. Naruto chucked at his mother, he then walked over to the barrel where the little girl hid. Hi there. Do you mind coming out? No answer. I know you are there, I just want to talk. With that, she slowly moved her head from behind the barrel to get a look at the blonde's face. Your face looks like the sky, she said. Now this was a first for Naruto. Usually, when someone said something about his face, it was often about his foxy features or his hair looked like an urchin. Why's that? he asked. Your hair is the sun, said as she pointed to his hair. She then pointed to his eye. Those are the sky. Well, said Naruto with a smile, that explains my sunny disposition on life. Disposition? Ah, it means that I'm very friendly. At that she began to come out from behind her barrel and Naruto got a better look at her. He felt intense angry when he saw all those scars on her arms and also noticed that she was missing about half of her teeth. Stay calm. She won't have to endure this for long. What's your name? She asked. Naruto and yours. I don't have one. My handler just calls me things like demon, filth, and bitc. She was cut off as Naruto quickly placed his hand over her mouth to silence her. He then looked back and forth to see if any rocks were coming his way. Sorry. But my mom has this thing about swearing. He took his hand away from her mouth and sighed. I have to go now. With that, the child with no name left, unaware with what would happen to her that night. It was about 10 minutes later when Naruto walked into his hotel room. Inside, his mother and friends were waiting for him. So, how did it go with her? Not bad, mom. But, was all that jumping up and down really necessary? You kind of looked like a fool. I didn't want her to be afraid of us said Aoi defensively. Remember that people will always let down their guard if they think they are dealing with a fool. By the way, interrupted Gara, are we sure we can trust that flea? He was a little vague, admitted Aoi. Flashback, one week ago. Miyoga was in Naruto fist after he had told them that there was another demon container out there. Naruto, from what Miyoga was feeling, had a very impressive grip. Why are you telling us this now? shouted Naruto. I didn't think it was important, said the flea as his face went red. With Sesamaru dead, what happens to his mother is no real concern to me. Miyoga began to gag. It was only a few days ago while I was in her village did I hear that the villagers were going to decapitate her. I thought you might like to know. Naruto, said Gara calmly, put the flea down. Naruto did as he was told. Thank you Lord Gara, said Miyoga. However, his relief was short-lived as Gara began to pound his ramen bowl on Miyoga till it broke. He then grabbed Temeriz and began to do the same. Feel better, asked Naruto when he saw Gara stop. Yes. Present, I'm surprised we got any information out of him after what you two put him through, said Tamari with a sigh. 
Then, coming from outside, the four of them heard the sounds of angry shouting. They looked out the window and saw a large crowd moving in the direction that the girl had gone. I don't like the looks of this, said Naruto. The girl realized something bad was happening the moment she got home. First thing that happened was a beating she got from her handler. After that, she was dragged outside and told to stop crying or she would get it some more. She did her best to stop and didn't receive more punishment from the man. About 20 minutes later a large crowd surrounded them. Some carried torches and sticks. Her handler cleared his throat to silence the people. Everyone, he shouted, the day we have waited for is her. No longer will we need to fear the wrath of evil that we have kept all these years. We will make sure that this demon will be unable to harm us as we wait for our savior to return to us once more. He turned to the girl. Demon, you will have your arms and legs removed so that you will be unable of running away or harming anyone ever again. He reached behind his back and pulled out a butcher knife. As he did this two people from behind her quickly grabbed her arms and pulled them out. Hey, came a loud voice, who are you calling a demon? Everyone stopped and turned in the direction of the voice. Who are you? asked the girl's handler. Where are my manners? exclaimed Aoi as she moved in front of her son. I am Aoi and this is my son Naruto. These two are his friends Gara and Tamari. Why have you stopped us? the man yelled. Because what you are going is sick, yelled Naruto. From what I can see you are all the demons here. The man's face grew dark Advi you could ever understand, since you were outsiders. A few years ago, while my wife was still alive and about to give birth, a four-tailed dog demon attacked us. There was no time to call for help and we have no priests in our midst to banish it away. Then an old woman and a man with black hair came to our village. At that moment, my wife gave birth to my daughter. The old woman said she could save our village if we scarified one more life. What was one more life to the countless others we had lost? That mean that she's your daughter, said Aoi as a killer intent came out of her. No, my daughter died that day as the demon was placed into her body. After that, the old woman said that would have to keep her alive until she returned. If we did, she said she would use her abilities to bring back those who had fallen during the attack. Right now we're just making sure that she can't go anywhere. Well, we have a problem then, said Naruto as both he and Gara stepped in front of Aoi. What do you mean? We aren't leaving without her, said Gara as he put on his psycho face. Yeah, she's coming with us, said Naruto. What makes you think that you can take on an entire village? A village of idiots who believe the dead can walk again will be no problem for us, said Gara as his gourd was uncorked. Sand shot out of it and began to circle around the area, keeping only the handler, the girl, the two guys holding the girl and the four from sand inside. The people began to throw thing at them, but the sand stopped each item. Here's how it's going to work, said Naruto. You will let her go and she'll come with us. In exchange, we won't kill you. It's a bargain. The two villagers holding the girl suddenly let go. They then charged at the sand shinobis shouting loudly. Tamari took out her large fan and used it like a baseball bat, hitting both of them in the stomach with one swing. The girl's father saw this and grew nervous. He realized that these children could not be normal. Demons, spitted the man. Well, not technically, said Naruto as he closed his eyes and smiled. We just contain them, said Gara as he imitated his friend. I hold Kayubi, said Naruto as he opened his eyes. And I am the container of Shukaku, said Gara as he did the same. The man looked into their eyes and what he saw scared him. He saw each of their demons growling at him. The Kayubi's fangs dripped with saliva. Shukaku looked like he was having a laughing fit. In a desperate act, he grabbed the girl and used her like a shield with his knife still in hand. Stay back you bastard, before he could finish, something from behind him grabbed his arms and pulled them back. Then a foot was placed on his back. The man turned his head and saw Aoi holding his arms. Say one more word and I will snap off your arms, she growled. Stop, the little girl suddenly shouted. She ran over to Aoi. Please don't hurt him, I don't want others to be hurt because of me. Before she could say any more her father shot his leg back and kicked her. Too late for that, he shouted. His eyes were wide and looked insane. You have already hurt us. All the problems we have been facing are your. He was about to continue his rant, but Aoi's foot slammed deep into his back. Naruto then walked over to the little girl, who was now crying her eyes out. He kneeled down and started to hug her. 
This surprised her since no one had ever done this to her before. What he said next surprised her even more. You're not a monster, he said simply. If anyone is, it's these damn villagers. Me and Gara are like you in so many ways. After the Kyubi was sealed in me, my village threw me out like I was trash. Gara had his sealed inside of him so he could be used like a weapon. We meet people, however, who looked at us and saw what we really are. Humans who have great promise. Now we want to help you out and take you to the place where you can be free. To act like a child and live. The girl began to cry harder. This was the first time anyone had ever talked to her like that. Like she was a real person. If this is a dream, then it is too cruel. When I wake up, I don't think I can keep going. Suddenly, she was picked up by Aoi. She, Gara, and Tamari jumped up onto a roof, but Naruto stayed put. One last thing before I go, he said with hatred in his eyes. What makes a demon is its action. You all tortured a little girl who was the one who kept the demon from killing all of you. The real reason you hate her is because you hate yourselves. You were too weak then, but now that she is trapped in a little girl, you are stronger. I have met real demons and they never do the sort of things that you have done. With that he joined his mother and his friends, leaving the people in the village to think. Over on a hill not far from the village, Orochimaru and his master were watching the events in the village. Should we grab them now? asked the snake man. No, replied the old woman. Let Naruto do the work of gathering the demon vessels for us. He will search them out and help make them stronger. Then, all we have to do is grab them. Once that happens, I will give you the true immortality that you seek. How is your infiltration of Akatsuki? It goes well, soon I will be able to leave and create my village. Excellent. With that, she began to laugh at the starry sky. The girl woke up the next morning to something new, a bed. For the first time in her life, she had slept on a real bed. She remembered that after they had left her village, she had cried herself to sleep because of what the blonde had said to her. She was shaken out of her memories as someone entered the room. It was Naruto. So, how are feeling? he asked. Good, she replied as she looked down. What will happen to me now? A direct little squirt, he said with a laugh. Well, I talked to my mom about it and she said that she won't let you live on your own. So, she said that she's adopting you. At this she turned to face Naruto. Shock was clearly written on her face. Well, say hello to your new big brother. Once again, she began to cry and gave him a hug. You will need a name. How about Mitsukai? All she could do was nod and the tears continued to fall. Naruto stayed with her till she stopped. Later that day the gang was shopping in the village for some clothes before they continued their journey home. Mitsukai really needed some. The stopped in a store and the manager greeted them. He had a long nose, a thin mustache, and spoke with a fake French accent. Ah, I have what you need, he said after hearing their request. This just came in from my homeland and is being sent to all the hidden villages. It is the latest in children's and ninja clothing. He went to the back and came back with the evil orange jumpsuit. He was grinning like an idiot. The case cage sighed in his office. The reason for this sigh was the extra paperwork her had to do since Aoi had been detained all summer. He had given her permission to go and pick up the new demon vessel, but somehow she was finding excuses to extend her trip. First, the girl needed new clothes and the store only sold evil orange jumpsuits, so they need to visit another village. Then, she needed to go to a demon dentist to have her teeth grown back in. After that, a visit to see all his parents and then a quick trip to the beach. The case cage had tried to tell her no, but it was a little hard to do that by mail. Every time he sent a letter telling her to come home, he'd always miss her. Normally, he didn't mind having her gone. The reason? He could swear again without worrying about being hit upside the head. However, because she was gone, he had to do all her paperwork. Apparently, her workload was at least three times his. How she was able to get it all done and still have a life was beyond him. Suddenly, Naruto came running into the room while dragging Gara. Before the case cage could say anything, Naruto was grabbing all the furniture and was moving it in front of the door. Gara just stood in the middle of the room with his arms crossed and a grin on his face. Wit scared the case cage as Naruto started to move his desk towards the door. When he was finished, Naruto looked at the case cage with a frightened look. Ya gotta hide me he said with panic in his voice. Why should I? asked the case cage in a dull voice. Because I'm your son's best friend. 
I don't like my son so why should I like you? This caused the blonde to use his knowledge of the elder man. There were two things he knew the older man could not resist. I could put a good word in for you with my mom. Plus, it gets you out of paperwork for a while. At this, the case cage's eyes light up. Come and tell your uncle, beep. What the problem is, please start at the beginning. Flashback. Time unknown the universe was empty. Nothing existed except a large ball of element and other things that make people wish they paid more attention to in astronomy. Not that beginning, roared the case cage, interrupting the flashback. Fast forward to three hours ago. Naruto and company had just arrived in the sand village. Mitsukai, who was dressed in a gray shirt and pants, was excited to see her new home. All the time she was with her new family, she had heard many stories about it. The way Naruto described it, it sounded like a nice meadow from a fairy tale. It looked a lot better in her mind to say the least. This is Hidden Sand Village, she asked her new brother. Just like I said, said Naruto. No annoying trees, nice warm temperature, windy, and full of life. This caused Mitsukai's eye to twitch. You're right, said Tamari with gritted teeth, however, you were a bit modest. There are no trees for hundreds of miles. The temperature is over 110 on a cool day. Wind. Yeah we got that. Don't forget the cobras, scorpions, tarantulas, coyotes, and lizards that make this place so full of life. When she was done, she looked over at Naruto to find him kneeled down and a dark cloud hung over his head. I like it, he said. Tamari's sweat dropped. Okay people, said the always cheery Aoi. We got stuff to do. Tamari, I need you to come with me so I can help you with that jutsu the Kagura showed you. Naruto and Gara, I want you two to show Mitsukai around. With that, both she and Tamari left. Naruto and Gara showed her around the village. They showed her the academy, the playground, the shopping district, their homes, and even the place where they first met. And to your left, said Naruto, is where Gara killed his uncle. He pointed over to a roof. You killed your uncle, asked Mitsukai to Gara. Hey, he tried to kill me first. This left her with another twitch in her eye. They kept walking for a while until Naruto spoke up again. And here folk, we have the best ramen stand in town Joe's. His voice trailed off as he looked at the now closed stand. What's going on here? This place is open 24 7. Naruto, please stay calm, said Gara to his friend. I think I know what's wrong here. What? demanded Naruto as he grabbed his best friend's shoulders. Gara simple pointed to a sign that said, Out of business. No, shouted Naruto. What's up with him? asked Mitsukai. Well, Ramen is his favorite food and this was the last ramen stand in sand, said Gara simply. He turned to see Naruto lighting black candles in front of the stand and saying a prayer. Maybe another stand opened up and Joe couldn't compete. Sorry, but you're wrong, said Naga as she walked towards them. She was carrying two large paper bags full of poisonous snakes. In cages. Nice to see you back Gara. How was your trip and who is this little sweetheart? Oh, it was fine and this is Mitsukai. So, how are you? Before she could respond, Naruto clung to her leg and looked up at her with tears in his eyes. Please, what happened to good old Joe? Oh, he's alright considering he lost his business. Naruto didn't left go, so Naga decided to continue. About two weeks after you left, some guy and his daughter came from Leaf and offered to buy the place. Well, Joe said no, of course. So, the two from Leaf went to his supplier and, from what I've heard, got them to stop selling to him. Joe then had no choice to sell. He had to pay his bills and he couldn't open shop without supplies. He had no choice but to sell them his stand. Then they closed it down and left. Naruto began to cry louder. Why did they do that? asked Mitsukai. From what she was seeing, her big brother was very upset about this. Well, my parents said that those two were the owners of Ichiraku in Leaf. Apparently, they were the nominated for a ramen contest and decided to get rid of the competition. At this, Red Chakra came surging out of Naruto. Was he angry? No he was way beyond angry. He was royally pissed. Someone from Leaf had come over and took away the last ramen stand in sand for a stupid contest. That was a stupid reason. Ah, Naruto? You do know that there is still instant ramen, said Gara, trying to calm Naruto down. Plus, I think you scaring Mitsukai. 
Slowly the red chakra began to fade as Naruto calmed down. Sorry, he said, but I couldn't help it. I can't live on instant alone. With that he picked up a stone near his feet and threw it down the street. Sadly, he hit someone who fell down like a sack of potatoes. Big brother, what did you do? I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. What else is new, said Gara. The four of them went over to the fallen victim to find a young girl with purple hair, about their age, wearing Chinese-style clothing. Naruto picked her up by the shoulders so that she was facing him and gave her a small shake. After that she began to wake up. You okay? asked Naruto. Sorry about hitting you with that rock. I really didn't see you there. The girl just stared at Naruto for a moment, and then her hands slowly moved behind Naruto's head. Listen, I said I'm, he was interrupted due to the girl's lips on his, giving him a kiss. Thank God for the French. The other three had mixed reactions. Gara was letting his perverted imagination get the best of him, causing him to get a small nosebleed. Naga was simply thinking that this girl was screwed up and Naruto was taking advantage of her. And Mitsukai, well, she didn't really understand what was going on. Hey, she's three. A few moments later, the kiss ended and the girl started to hug him. Woe I me, she said in Mandarin. Naruto looked like he was out for the count. What did she say? asked Mitsukai as she poked her brother. They all looked at each other and shrugged. Gara turned to the girl. What was that about? he asked. The girl brought a hand behind her back and pulled out an old dirty book and handed it to Gara. Once she had done that, she returned to hugging Naruto. Gara began to read. This says that she is from the village of the Amazons. A village of female ninja that have some odd rules. Gara turned the page. It says here that if she loses in battle of any kind, she must give her opponent a kiss of death. Wow, said Naruto as he was finally coming out of it. They sure know how to send a guy off. Wait, there's more. If the opponent is male, then she must marry him. Woe I me, the girl said again. Now Naruto's head was a buzz. He had to marry her just because he knocked her down. There had to be something more. He tried to get up, but the girl won't let him. She clung on to him and refused to let go. Shampoo take good care of husband, is okay, yes? Well, ah, shampoo is it? I'm not ready for something like this just yet. I haven't even hit puberty, so I can't get married. This seemed to mean nothing to Shampoo. He turned and looked at Naga. Could you please take Mitsukai home for me? Ah, sure thing Naruto. What are you going to do? After she said that, Naruto did a quick substation leaving Shampoo with a garbage can and running away with Gara. Shampoo was startled by this, and then started yelling in Mandarin. What she was yelling use I don't speak Mandarin. End flashback. The K's cage, Gara, and Naruto were sitting down and calmly drinking tea. They all let out a sigh. I was if, for one moment, all three of them were getting along. So that's my problem, said Naruto. So, what should I do? As he asked this, his eyes became larger and a river of tears shot out from his eyes. Then, he grew wings and a halo. Do not worry, replied the K's cage. I have dealt with this kind of problem before. The first thing you must do is follow me. He got up and moved up to the now cleared doorway. Naruto and Gara went over there and walked out of the door that the K's cage opened for them. They then turned to face him. Where are we going? They asked. Don't know, don't care, goodbye, said the K's cage as he slammed the door in their faces. Just when you think he has finally warmed up to us, he does this, said Naruto. Maybe he's still mad at us for that one time we used the sexy jutsu on him during that council meeting, suggested Gara. As they walked to Naruto's house, they discussed the various things they had done to the K's cage over the years. From filling his bathroom with sand to tricking him to swear in front of Aoi to putting a truth potion in his sake. Their favorite prank had to be the time they dyed all his robes pink before a meeting of the shinobi nation leaders. Good times, good times. Good, you two are back said Aoi. Naruto, your fiancé is here. Naruto looked and saw his mom, Shampoo, an angry Tamari, for what, he had no clue, and an old woman on a cane. They were at the dinner table, eating ramen. How did she get here, shouted Naruto. She followed Naga and Mitsukai, said Aoi before slurping down some noodles. Now then, I think we need to talk. Indeed, said the old woman. Son-in-law, you must take responsibility and marry Shampoo as soon as possible. 
Who are you? asked Naruto as he pointed to the old woman. She is Shampoo great great grandmother and former leader of Amazon Village, said Shampoo. Yes, now to the matter at hand, said the old woman. You have defeated Shampoo in battle and now must marry her. There is 4,000 years of history and tradition riding on this. I didn't fight her, shout Naruto. Gara nodded. I just randomly threw a rock, it wasn't a fight. An Amazon is always in combat, replied the old woman. This law must be obeyed. Now hold on, said Aoi, let's compromise. Naruto did defeat Shampoo, but it was an accident. So he will put so effort in this, but will be free to date other people. He will not be wed until he is at least a chunin. When that time comes, Naruto will choose who he will wed if that relationship doesn't work out, then he is back on the market. She paused to finish her noodles. I think we can all agree to this. The old woman began to think. When the boy became a strong and capable warrior, then he could marry, which would be the best thing for Shampoo. If there was any real competition, the problem would simply disappear before the deadline. Or afterwards it didn't matter to her as long as they made it look like an accident. I accept your terms, said the old crone. Come Shampoo we have to open up shop now. What do you do? asked Naruto. Probably a special place, said Gara with a perverted giggle. Shampoo no know what that mean, but we open up ramen shop called Cat Cafe, said the young Amazon. I think I'm in love, shouted the blonde. Shampoo giggled at this and went over to him and gave him another kiss. Once again, thank you French people. This scene caused Temeri's eye to twitch. Why am I getting angry over this, she thought. Just take deep breaths and you'll be able to figure it out girl. After the kiss was finally done, the two Chinese gals left. Why do you get all the luck? asked Gara as he pulled out his orange book. Must fight urge to kill, said Gara. I'm right behind you, bro, said Naruto. They were doing a task that was not meant to be done by any shinobi. It was a completely useless skill, it was knitting. Now you might be wondering why they are knitting. The answer to that is simple. As academy students working on teamwork, they are given homework that is considered D-rank missions. This frees up the genin of the village to do real missions and gives the students time to work out the kinks in their teamwork. Plus, since they are students, they don't get paid. Future Team 3's mission. Help out a little old lady with her knitting. Why is my sister getting out of this, said the twelve-year-old Gara. She watching, all my shinobi, with the hag, replied the other twelve-year-old. Don't whine, we drew straws and she won. We are demon containers. We are like, the best of the best. Why are we doing this? As Gara said this, a waterfall of tears came from his eyes. Would you rather be doing this with you? Asked Naruto with a smirk. Even after the case cage found out that Yu has indeed a male, he tried to arrange a marriage with him and Gara. Yu was very happy with this situation, but Gara wasn't. Gara was about to say something, but Tamari and the old woman same in from the other room. Tamari, 13 now, had her hair in the famous four pigtail style. She was wearing a white shirt and skirt with a red sash and a fishnet underneath it. On her back was her fan. Thank you for your help boys, said the little old lady that would remind anyone of their favorite grandmother. Would you like any sugar cookies before you leave? Naruto and Temeri's eyes went wide remembering the last time Gara had sugar. The grabbed Gara while politely declining her offer. In the past few years Naruto had changed drastically. He was dressed in a red GI shirt with no sleeves and matching red baggy pants. Over that was a white sleeveless trench coat with the kanji for Foxy written on the back. As always, his coat was left open. His arms were bare so that everyone could see his very muscular arms. On his side was the Kitsunsaiga, which went with him not matter where he was. His face had little baby fat, even though he ate about 10 bowls of ramen a day. Gara was dressed in a black outfit with a white sash that went across his chest, on his back was a new gourd. Of course he didn't need it out here in the desert, sand was everywhere. Hey guys, called out Naga as she saw her friends, how was your homework? Fine, said Gara as he eyed the scroll, what do you have there? I won it on Ninbei, said the snake lover, it's a snake summoning contract for cobras. The guy who sold it to me even added a couple of jutsus. As she went on with her deal, Ran's face became twisted with anger. Shut up, she screamed. A second later she stormed away. What's with her? asked Tamari. 
Naga let out a sigh and explained to the group that she had been outbid again for a green spandex outfit by Flames of Youth once again. Meanwhile, a certain man in Leaf was offering his students more green spandex, which two of them refused. Where do you think he gets all of it? Well, said Naga, I gotta go. Gotta get up early so I can meet up with the rest of the team before we get our sensei. Naga was on the same team as Makoto Fuafua and Yu Yudai. Everyone felt pity for the teammates of that cross-dressing, gender-confused male. There was a rumor going around that the Jonin were fighting to get out of being a sensei out of fear of ending up with that team. The three of them continued on their way and were soon standing in the Chinese cafe. This was one of the only three restaurants left in town. It was hard, but the place seemed to keep up to the increased taxes that the daimyo keep placing on them. Inside, Team 3 saw the other team that would be graduating tomorrow. Ryu Itami was sitting down, eating dumplings, in a larger version of the outfit that he had worn in the last tournament. To his right was Ryuta Chikusho. Like Ryu, Ryuta's outfit hadn't changed much. The only difference was that he was taller and had spikes on his shoulders. The final member of the group was Shinobu Kayui. She was dressed in a gray trench coat that was zipped up. Bu looked up and quickly looked down when she saw her secret crush walk in. She had never told anyone her feelings for the blonde fox boy, not even her teammates. She knew she wasn't the only one who had a crush on him, but the others who followed him around would end up with their memories erased by his number one fangirl. Naruto, not noticing the red headed female, saw his mother and his grandparents at a table near the kitchen. Moroku and Sango were in the village for his graduation that would be taking place tomorrow. Mitsukai was there as well, dressed in a white outfit that looked like a dress version of what Sesamaru used to wear with a metal spiky belt, no tail thingy. As they sat down shampoo came out with 15 bowls of ramen. 10 were for Naruto and the rest were for everyone else. Shampoo makes these for husband, said shampoo as she set down the bowl, is okay, yes? Yeah, replied Naruto, it's fine. Thanks for the meal. He stiffened as Shampoo put her arms around his neck and kissed him on the check. Shampoo do anything for husband. With that, the Amazon left. I knew he was my grandson, exclaimed the old monk as he laughed. I remember when I was your age. Just remember to ask if they would mind bearing your child. The ladies couldn't keep their hands off of me. Maybe that was because they wanted to beat you into a bloody pulp replied his wife who sent him an angry glare. Naruto, don't end up like this old fool. Women aren't, G-A-A-R-A -A -A but the book away. Gara didn't reply as he continued to read his favorite orange book. The night continued without much else happening, to them at least. On the other side of the village, Taiki was worried about the Genin tournament. This would be his fourth time taking it. No matter how high his grades were, his scores were at least Chunin level. His physical abilities keep him from advancing. It was bad enough losing to Gara, but he was weaker than an eight year old. The injustice of it all, he cried. I am superior to all those fool. Why Kami must I be punished for my brilliance? It seemed having his ass handed to him many times had not humbled him. As he continued on his was while ranting, he saw a figure in a black robe enter the village by slipping past the guards. Hum, maybe I can use this. Taiki followed the intruder into a small bar not too far from the gate. He observed him for a while and then approached him with great confidence. Hello Mr. Missing Leaf Nin, said Taiki as he pushed up his glasses. The stranger looked shocked. How did you know, he asked. You're still wearing your leaf headband and I saw you sneak in. Listen you little, shut up, interrupted Taiki. I have a proposition for you that will benefit us both. But first I must know more about you like your name and what you did that made you a missing nin. The stranger was quiet for a moment. My name is Mizuki, he said. I recently tried to steal the forbidden scroll, but I was caught. I see. Well then the information should help you. There are two people in this village that, if killed, will help get me into the shinobi program and you back into chunin lifestyle. I don't see how that can happen, replied Mizuki. Well maybe this will can your mind. Tell me have you ever heard of the demon vessels of Kayubi and Shukaku? Later that night, Naruto and Mitsukai were having a light workout before bed in their backyard. Aoi watched as Mitsukai sent a fury of punches towards her brother who dodged and blocked with grace. Naruto, realizing that it was close to her bedtime, gave her a flick to the forehead that stopped her, more like Itachi than Tsunade. Ah, she screamed. Why can't I beat you? 
I don't know, replied Naruto with a grin. Maybe because I'm older, bigger, and have more experience? Mitsukai looked at him and let out a sigh. She respected him more than anyone else in the village. He was the first one to ever show her any kind of kindness. In his spare time he trained her and was helping her to reach for her demonic powers. But, she would never tell him how she felt. That doesn't matter, she said. I should still be able to at least hit you once. Maybe tomorrow squirt. Right now it's time for bed. The next day Tamari had gotten up early to make a good impression and to make sure Gara would also. He had a habit of being late due to those books of his. She showered, dried off, and got dressed. After that she made herself a quick breakfast which she ate quickly. Seeing as Gara hadn't come down she decided to see what the problem was. How can a guy who never sleeps be late in the morning, she said as she walked up the stairs. I bet he's reading those books again. Without knocking, she opened the door to find Gara watching the TV with great interest. Oh no, said Gara as he moved his sand to hide what he was watching. Was that what I think it was, asked his sister with her teeth gritted. No, I don't know what you're taking about, stammered Gara. Mother, came a voice for the TV. You're into that. That being said, Tamari moved at lightning speed to see what he was watching. What she saw shocked her more than anything she had seen before. You're watching Bambi, she cried out. Then she started to laugh, very, very hard. Gara turned off the TV and stormed out of the room. His face was beat red. The world must never know, was all he said as he made his way towards the academy. Naruto woke up to something next to him. Something warm. Karara was the first thing that came to his mind but remember that she liked to sleep next to Mitsukai. He slowly opened his eyes which became white dishes in a few seconds. There was shampoo, in her bra and panties, sleeping next to him. Suddenly he felt a large wave of killer intent. He slowly turned his head to Shia's grandmother standing at his door. She was giving him the same look she gave her husband when she found him being a pervert. It's Mo what you think, cried Naruto. This, however, caused everyone else in the house to run to his room and find out what was going on. Moroku gave him a thumbs up. Aoi brought out her paper fan. Mitsukai just wondered what was going on. I ran, said Shampoo as she chose this moment to wake up. She got up and gave Naruto a kiss on the check. This is going to be painful, said Naruto as waterfalls of tears came out of his eyes. An hour later, Team 3 was sitting at their table at the academy. Tamari was still laughing her head off while Gara was trying to ignore her. Naruto looked like he had come out of a bar fight and lost miserably. What happened to you? asked Gara. Don't ask, what's with your sister? Don't ask. Gara simple hid in a cocoon of sand. Let's move it, said Makoto as he tried to get in. He was wearing a blue shirt and gray pants. On his back was his clan's symbol. Okay my kikis, said the principal. Today you all graduate. Now before I tell you your John and senseis, I have a present for ya all. He handed them all a pineapple which exploded in their faces. Ha ha ha. Now for the teams. Team 3 has Baki. Team 6, Naga, Yu, and Makoto, has Kiji. And Team 11 has Orizondo. That is all. Bye bye now. With that, Principal Kuno left. A few minutes later, Baki came into the room and told his team to meet him on the roof. When they got there he began the introductions. My name is Baki and I'm going to be your Jonin sensei. Now before we begin I would like you all to tell me about yourselves. I'll go first, said Tamari. My name is Tamari and I'm a wind user. I like chestnuts, my friends, my brother, and botany. I dislike squid and people who are mean to my brother. My dream is to become the most powerful wind user in the world. My name is Gara. I like porn and my friends. I dislike people who try to take away my porn, people who try to kill me, boys who hit on my sister, and people who betray my trust. My dream is to become K's cage or to become a super pervert like Jiraiya. When Gara said super pervert, his sand shot into the air and shaped itself into the kanji for super pervert. My name is Naruto. I like to trains and ramen. I dislike being hit on the head by my mother's fan, the three minutes it takes ramen to heat up, and the idiots in the leaf village. My dream is to become K's cage so that I can create a home for all the demons, half demons, and demon vessels that need a home. Interesting group. Okay now that that's out of the way, I want to talk about, 
Baki was cut off as a giant shuriken was stopped by Gara's sand shield. The person who threw said object appeared before them. Impressive for a demon, said Mizuki. Who are you? demanded Baki. Just a guy trying to get rid of your demon problem. Also I have a score to settle with the Kayubi, Mizuki points to Tamari. Moron, said Naruto. I'm Kayubi's container, I was close. Anyways, I'm going to finish what was started in Leaf. Mizuki grabbed the other shuriken that was on his back. Death to all demons, he shouted as he flung it at the trio. However, Tamari pulled out her fan and created a gust of wind that stopped the shuriken in its tracks. This shocked Mizuki. Why are you helping them? Are you some kind of demon lover? These are my friends and family you're talking about, said Tamari. I would protect them even if they were squids. Everyone's sweat dropped to this. Let's get rid of this fool, said Gara as the sand began to rise around him. I can't wait, said Naruto. Naruto began to make a new set of hand signs. Kitsune style. Foxfire Inferno. A blast of green flame came out of his mouth. At the same time, Gara said, Tanuki style, San Shuriken. Then, together they said, Demon combo style, Blast Shuriken. Gara's sand had gone through Naruto's fire and came out as spears of glass moving very fast. Mizuki didn't react in time and was impaled all over his body by the attack. The three of them then turned to face their sensei. So, said Gara, you were saying, Never mind you all pass I was going to give you to test your teamwork and your ability to kill the enemy. Meet me at training field 3 on Monday. Yes sensei, said all three of them. With that they went to tell Aoi, who was waiting with her parents to meet them, the good news. Near the south border in wind country there is a small town of Libra. This town holds no real importance. There is no mining and isn't connected to any major roads. It has no real history. Even thieves do not enter this village because it would be a waste of their time. So why were Naruto, Gara, and Tamari entering this village? One word. Mission. They had been genin for about a month now and had done several C-class missions with Baki. Their first mission was to escort a noble man for a few days. Nothing eventful had occurred other than an encounter with a poisonous snake. Their second mission was to take out a bandit gang. Naruto had used his sexy jutsu to infiltrate the gang as a. Well if you can guess then you're not old enough to know. After he had found out how many there were, luckily before they tried anything on him, Gara began to use the sand to crush half while Tamari got the ones who were running. They had other missions after that, but this was the first time that they were going solo. The reason was that Baki was needed elsewhere and the case cage felt that they were ready for this mission. The mission was simple. Contact the client in Libra about strange disappearances occurring in the village. Then, if other shinobi weren't involved, handle the situation. If other shinobi were involved, then send for reinforcements. So this is Libra, said Tamari as they entered. It looked like a small farming village, minus the farming. The houses were spread far apart and the roads weren't paved. However, on the other end of town, there was a large cathedral like building. As the sand nins got closer to it, they could make out shapes on the windows. They wear all of a single man in different poses. The man had red eyes and long flowing black hair. In some of the windows it looked like he was helping out a village from up in the clouds. Another depicted him killing dog demons. This piqued Naruto's interest. He saw a priest-like man coming out of the building and decided to ask a few questions. Excuse me, said Naruto politely, what faith does this belong to? Ho ho ho, lighted the priest. This is dedicated to a man who became a god and killed many demons. He then took those who were pure of heart to a better world. However, demons who hated this pure hearted man killed him. We believe that one day our Lord will return to save the world and help the faithful enter a place of never ending light. Now I must go now and set up today's procession. If you like, you can join us. With that, he quickly went back into the temple. Naruto turned back to his team. Any clues to what he was talking about? Probable occult, said Gara, who was reading his orange book. It has nothing to do with us. Let's just find our client and get home. That movie you wanted to see will be playing soon. With that, they began to walk again. So, where are we meeting her again? asked the fox container. Over there, said Tamari as she pointed to a food stand. They each took a seat and placed a small order while they waited. 
It wasn't long until they were approached by a tan-skinned girl with dark hair with a little red mixed in. She looked about 15 years old. Are you the shinobi from the sand village? She asked. Need you ask? Snorted Tamari as she pointed to the headband she wore around her neck. Let's get to the point. Agreed. My name is Rose, yes, that Rose. Got a problem with that? The disappearance began a few years ago when the cathedral was built. At first, it was maybe once or twice a year. People believe that they had simply moved away. Anyone around here could believe that since nothing ever happens around here. Then, they began to increase. And it wasn't just townspeople, it was travelers who were visiting or people who had simple gotten lost. So who did you lose? asked Gara as he took a bite of his food. Rose let out a gasp. My boyfriend. He disappeared a few weeks ago, how did you know? People tend to do nothing about a situation until it affects them in some way. Anything else odd happening around here? Yes, replied Rose. Our town's drunk became the head of the church. One day he was pissing on the side of the building and the next day he's dressed in their robes. That's odd, commented Naruto. There is something else, said Rose. An old woman appears from time to time with a pale-skinned man. They were the ones who had built the cathedral and began to convert most of the townspeople. No one knows who they are, so there isn't much I can tell you. Well now I have a few questions, said Gara. Any shinobi or any other powerful looking people enter here? No, how about people who look like they have no fashion sense? I heard that some really powerful people like to dress up as idiots, said Naruto. No, well then let's check out the cathedral then, said Tamari. Why there, asked Rose. That's the place where this all started, said Gara. It's the most logical place to check out. Well, there will be a mass starting in an hour. You could check it out then, said Rose. This sounded good to the three sand nins, so they agreed. But unknown to them, the old woman was watching them from a window in the cathedral. She turned to face Orochimaru, who was sitting down reading the funny pages. Looks like they are here, she said. Shall I take care of them? asked Orochimaru with a wide grin. No, they are no ripe enough to pick. Plus, I want Naruto to gather the other vessels. Once he has done that, then I will have them collected in one strike. So, what should we do then? We'll let Omar entertain them. If they find out about me, then the effectiveness of the plan will be cut in half. I have waited too long for this plan to fail. Now tell Omar to hold a special mass and then we will leave. As you command, master. About 45 minutes later, Team 3 was standing in front of the cathedral discussing the plan. Tamari suggested that they sit through the gathering and tea of the ordinary that went on. Afterwards, they could talk to the drunk turned priest. Naruto and Gara agreed with this point of action and were about to go in when they saw something that caught their eye. What's that? asked Tamari as she saw a huge pillar of sand coming their way. She looked at Gara for the answer. What am I, Mr. Know It All? he deadpanned. I do, said Naruto with fear in his voice as the object causing the sand pillar got closer. It was shampoo on her bike in a wedding dress. When she got close enough she jumped up and flew towards Naruto who caught her. Her bike flew into Tamari who went out like a light. Gara started poking her with a stick. Naruto happy to see his shampoo, yes. What are you doing here shampoo? asked Naruto who set her down. Shampoo here that Naruto go to Libra. Shampoo then learn from great granny Libra have large temple so we wed now. All of a sudden Tamari jumped up and burst into flames causing Gara to back away slowly. We are on a mission, we do not have time for this. So Naruto, we wed so, yes, said Shampoo ignoring Tamari completely causing her to face fault. Tamari is right, said Naruto. We have to complete this mission first, if you want to help you could watch the back for anything suspicious. He gave her his foxy smile that caused her to melt into a puddle. After Shampoo agreed to help, the three shinobi went into the temple. The inside was several stories tall with many chandeliers. Pews and candles filled the main floor and the several balconies. At the end of the temple was an altar where the sand trio could only assume the events took place. Behind the altar was a golden door that seemed to go up all the way to the roof. Seeing that the mass was about to begin the three of them took a seat in the middle so they could get a good view and not draw too much attention. The procession was dull. There was chanting and singing that made them feel embarrassed. Time seemed to move very slowly until something caught their attention. Now we shall have the sacrifice, said Omar. 
he was a large and bald man. As he said this, two men in cloaks brought in a man who didn't seem like he was happy with this. Do not worry child, he said to the sacrifice. Only those who have the divine blessing of the Lord will are allowed to stay. All others shall join him in eternal peace. With that, the men dragged him close to the golden door and Omar walked back to the altar. We offer this sacrifice to you Lord Naraku, who rules all, Omar continued his chant while the golden doors slowly opened. Several shadowy hands shot out and grabbed the poor man who was screaming at the top of his lungs. He was quickly pulled in and the doors slammed shut. Naraku, I'm sure I have heard that name before, pondered Gara. I know who he is, said Naruto. He's the demon my grandparents defeated over 30 years ago. From what I was told he consumed other demons and stole their powers. He's also the one responsible for the deaths of Kikyo, Sesamaru, Rin, and Jaken. Why are these idiots worshipping him? Why do people worship the devil? asked Tamari. The mass was over after the sacrifice and people slowly began to leave. It was then Naruto and company could see it in their faces. They didn't come here because they believed in this faith. They came because they were afraid. Fear made them worship this monster. Ah, the three from the sand village, said Omar as he noticed they hadn't moved. Is there something I can do for you? Yeah, there is, said Tamari as they got up and began to move towards him. Are you the one who has been abducting innocent people? Depends on what you mean by innocent, replied Omar. Perhaps by your standards, yes they were innocent, but, to me, they were sinners who needed to be saved. They have gone to become one with the Great One. Are you out of your mind, said Gara. For a while, I was. I had refused to believe in the word of Naraku. Yes I was quite insane. Then, when I was chosen to be judged, I saw the light. Flashback. Omar was flung out of the gold door. He just laid there, drool flowing onto the floor. Slowly, the old woman and Orochimaru walked over to him from the shadows. It seems one has survived, said Orochimaru. The old woman said nothing but slowly knelt down towards Omar. She reached out her hand to his face and something freakish happened. Her hand became like melted candle wax. Each of her fingers shot towards Omar and entered his body. One entered through his mouth, another to his ears, and the final two entered his eyes. It lasted for several minutes. When it was finally over, she got back up and smiled at him. Spread the word, was all she said as she walked back into the shadows. End flashback. And ever since that day I have. I will follow the path my lord has given me. Those who will not worship him will be sent to him so that Naraku can forgive them face to face. Yep, said Tamari. We can put this guy in the crazy box. Naraku isn't a god, said Naruto. He was a half demon who killed people for his own selfish desires. There wasn't anything merciful about him. I will not tolerate this blasphemy. With that, his arms turned whites and began to drip. I shall make sure you step through those doors and meet the great Naraku. Wax bullets. Dozens of small, hot, waxy projectiles went soaring towards them. They dodged the attack and prepared to counter attack. Take this, Tanuki style, sand shuriken, however, the attack never came. Instead, lightning like energy struck Gara. You fools! We are in the temple of Naraku, demon chakra cannot be used in these hallowed halls. Eat this, cutting whirlwind jutsu, however, like Gara, the lightning like energy struck her and cancelled the jutsu. Both of them looked unharmed. Omar decided to continue his attack. His arms began to reshape themselves into axe blades. They then began to stretch out and swung at the siblings. Gara dodged it completely, but Tamari ended up with a cut on her arm. While he was preparing to do this again, Naruto ran towards him at incredible speed and landed a punch in his face. When he did this, it made the same sound as someone punching mud. As gravity took over, Naruto continued his barrage PF punches all the way down. Why can't we use our jutsus? asked Tamari as they watched Naruto. He said demon chakra couldn't be used here, but I don't have any. Perhaps it's not meant to be taken literally, said Gara. This guy is nuts. He believes anyone who isn't on his side is evil, a demon. So I guess there must be something in here that is neutralizing our attacks. Their conversation was cut short when they heard a clasping sound. They looked up and saw that Omar had returned his arms and hands back to normal and was holding Naruto in the air by the sides of his head. Omar's face had a fist imprint on it several inches deep along with every other place Naruto had hit. 
Foolish sinner, said Omar in a whisper-like voice as he threw Naruto into the pew, breaking them. You cannot defeat Naraku's chosen one. Tamari jumped into the air with her iron fan in hand. She used it like a bat and hit him on the side of the head, deforming his face even more. He then threw a punch into her gut and sent her into the pews as well. He tried to talk, however he could no longer moor his mouth due to the condition of his face. Naruto and Tamari got up and saw that Gara was smirking. It seems you have a weakness after all. Once damage is done, it compromises other functions of the body. You may be alive, but the more damage we do the less you can do. Naruto, Tamari, let's get him. All three of them then jumped into the air and prepared to strike. Tamari was once again using her iron fan as a club aimed for his left shoulder. Gara was using his fists aimed for his neck. Naruto pulled his kitsunsaiga out of its sheath and aimed for his right arm. Omar saw the attacks and shot out his arms towards Tamari and Gara. Tamari saw the arm coming and used her fan to hit it first, cutting it in two. Naruto saw the attack coming for Gara and threw his blade a lengthening arm. Omar was shocked when he was his arm cut off by the seer force of Naruto's attack. Pain soon took the place of shock when Gara's fist went into Omar's neck. Omar fell down, gasping breath but it was useless. The pathways that led to his lungs from his neck were closed. A few minutes later, he was dead. All right, let's check out what was going on here, said Tamari after the death was confirmed. At that moment, however, the cathedral began to crumble. They watched as bricks and other objects began to fall down. Time to go, said Naruto as then ran outside. A few minutes later, all that was left of the building was a pile of ruins. Shampoo was waiting for them and asked what happened. They were halfway thought the story when they became aware that they were surrounded by the villagers. Ah, hi guys, said Naruto in a cheerful voice. Demons, cried one of the villagers. They have to be demons to have killed Omar and destroy that place. We're shinobi of the sand, shouted Tamari. We aren't demons. However, he words fell on deaf ears as stones were thrown at them. Even Rose, the person who had hired them, was joining in. The three of the, minus Gara because he doesn't need to dodge, dodged the stones and quickly ran out of the village. We so so sorry we help you, shouted Shampoo once they were a fair distance away from Libra. Why you all no fight back? Wasn't worth it, said Gara as he pulled out his book once again. Before he could begin he was stopped by an angry voice. I hate you all, screamed Rose. Because of you, I'll never know what happened to my boyfriend. All my hopes are gone because of you. We weren't hired to find your boyfriend, said Naruto. We were hired to handle the situation and we did. Nowhere did it ask us to rescue anyone. Besides, they are dead. With that Rose looked up. I guess you never went to a mass. There were human sacrifices going on in there. The people who went there knew what was going on and did nothing, I'm sorry for your lose but now our mission is over. With that, they began to leave. What are we supposed to do now? asked Rose. Naruto answered without turning around. Not our problem, but, if you want my advice, start over. Now they had something more important to talk about. We learned two important things on this mission, said Naruto. The first is that the same people who sealed the four tails in Mitsukai are most likely involved. Unless there is another old hag running around with a pale-skinned, black-haired man. The second is that they are involved with some very dark forces, mainly Naraku. Ya yeah, I agree, said Gara. but, what are they after? Well, it has to have something with the great-tailed demons, stated Tamari. They could be trying to revive Naraku. Or maybe they are going to do it then offer up the demon vessels so he can absorb their powers. I can believe the second, but not the first, said Naruto. I agree, said Gara. If they needed the tailed demons, why didn't they take Mitsukai with them when they had the chance? Why leave her and go through the trouble of going back? They continued their discussion as they walked through the desert, unaware of the two pairs of eyes watching them. We gathered many souls from that village, said Orochimaru as he held up a glass cylinder. In it were dozens of small blue spheres. Yes we did, replied the old woman. Pity, I was hoping to use that village for a while longer. But all good things must come to an end. Now, let us use the sand to destroy the leaf village. But, I thought we were going to wait until Naruto had gathered all of the demon vessels to start our war. That foolish daimyo has nearly crippled the sand village. 
It is on the verge of collapsing. It will have to be soon. Now, get to work. As you command, master. By the time Team 3 had gotten back, they were still no closer to finding out what the Naraku worshippers were planning. Hey you little brat, shouted a voice from around the corner, you're cheating me. Shut up, replied a voice that could only be Mitsukai. You placed the bet, now pay up. The trio turned the corner to see Mitsukai had set up a poker table in the middle of the street. She was playing against a woman with blonde hair, big jugs, and a diamond mark on her forehead. Next to her was a black-haired woman holding a pig. What going on here? asked Naruto as he walked over. Oh, hi big brother, said Mitsukai. I set up this table so we could get some extra money around the house. I used the Tensega I got as the opening bid and then with loser, points to the woman in front of her, comes over and starts losing at every hand. You bet the Tensega for a few dollars? Well, yeah. It's a useless sword that can't kill. Mami Sesamaru, best name I could find, told me so. Why can't I win? The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.